If you like the story you can support the author on Patreon link is in the description. Chapter 461, Wow Success Shinichi and his friends were riding the wave of excitement generated by the recent release of Kishin's Page, World of Warcraft, Wow. In just a few days since its launch, Wow had captivated a vast number of gamers across Japan, a country where the RPG and Page genres have long been beloved. Given Wow's intricate world-building and engaging gameplay, its rapid ascent to popularity among Japanese gamers was hardly a surprise. Let's group up again later and level together. Arnold suggested eagerly to Shinichi and the rest of their crew. Shinichi, Arnold, Satoshi, Ryo, and Takeshi had already experienced the joys of teaming up in WoW, making their way through its expansive universe side by side. Thanks to Kishin Play Software's, KPS, integration, their in-game and KPS friend lists were synced, showing which friends were online and their current levels in WoW, making it easier to form a party and embark on adventures together. Since most of us hit level 20 yesterday, how about we tackle the Wailing Caverns dungeon later on? Proposed Satoshi. That sounds like a plan. It should be easier to level up there as a group, agreed Ryo, nodding. I tried venturing there solo when I was around level 17, but it was pretty tough, Takeshi admitted. That's because you went alone, Arnold laughed, reminding Takeshi of the benefits of their teamwork. Their banter and planning filled the air with anticipation for the next in-game session. Shinichi chimed in with the group, feeling a mix of relief and secrecy. He felt somewhat lucky for not having used the KPS account that was already set up on his family's home computer to play WoW. If he had, his friends connected through KPS might have discovered that he had managed to level a character up to 35, a feat made possible by his early access to the game at home a perk of being in the Suzuki household. But now, since Shinichi chose to use his main KPS account on the computer in his room, his game level was the same with his friends. This decision kept his advanced progress a secret allowing him to enjoy the game at the same pace as his friends without revealing his early head start. Dash. The Kishin team responsible for World of Warcraft, WoW, dedicated significant effort to extensive market research prior to launching the game on a global scale. Understanding that gamer preferences vary from region to region, they needed to gauge interest levels across different demographics, particularly in the US and Europe. This involved not just translating the game's text into multiple languages but also potentially modifying cultural references to resonate better with diverse player bases. This meticulous process, crucial for ensuring the game's international appeal, could naturally extend over several months. Additional considerations included legal and regulatory compliance in different countries, which could vary widely in terms of content restrictions and online interaction rules. However, Kishin, being an industry leader with extensive connections and resources, was in a unique position to expedite some of these processes. Leveraging established relationships with global distributors and utilizing their experienced localization teams, Kishin could streamline the translation and cultural adaptation phases. Kishin had already established a global network of servers due to the success and reach of their Kishin Play software, KPS, a third-party solution enabling multiplayer capabilities for PC video games. This existing infrastructure provided a solid foundation for the seamless introduction of World of Warcraft, WoW, into various markets around the world. However, the launch of WoW required more than just leveraging existing servers, it necessitated a specialized setup to cater to the unique demands of a massively multiplayer online role-playing game, Merpage. Therefore, Kishin embarked on further expanding and optimizing their server network specifically for WoW. This entailed not only increasing server capacity to handle the expected influx of players but also ensuring that these servers could maintain the game's immersive experience by supporting the vast, dynamic worlds and real-time gameplay without lag or interruptions. The dual approach of utilizing KPS's existing framework while also establishing dedicated WoW servers allowed Kishin to expedite the game's global rollout. This strategy demonstrated the company's foresight in leveraging existing assets while also investing in necessary expansions to meet the particular needs of a new and ambitious game like WoW. Kishin's proactive measures ensured that players worldwide would enjoy a stable and responsive gaming experience, this initiative alone highlights how the WoW team is upholding Kishin's dedication to excellence and maintaining its status as a frontrunner in the video game world. The gaming industry watched in awe as Kishin's World of Warcraft, WoW, quickly became a monumental success. Other video game studios, both competitors and newcomers alike, took note of the game's impressive estimated sales 45,000 units in just a matter of days, with each copy priced at $49.9, equivalent to approximately 6,200 yen. The total revenue, an astonishing 279 million yen, 
was a testament to the game's immediate success and Kishin's significant profit from the launch. Competing studios and industry insiders were both impressed and concerned by these numbers. They saw Kishin's triumph not just as a win for one company but as a landmark moment for the merpage genre itself. The success of WoW signified a growing demand for immersive, expansive online worlds, and many studios began to reassess their current projects and future plans in light of this new market trend. Conversations within the industry shifted towards the elements that made WoW so captivating, its vast, open-world design, rich storytelling, and community-driven gameplay. Developers and executives pondered how they could incorporate similar features into their own games or whether they should explore partnerships with Kishin to leverage their now-proven expertise in the Merpage arena. However, alongside admiration, there was also a sense of urgency. Studios recognized that to remain relevant, they needed to innovate and possibly even pivot their strategies to compete in this evolving landscape. The success of WoW set a new benchmark, raising player expectations for quality and engagement in online gaming experiences. Chapter 462, Kishin Aerospace World of Warcraft, WoW, has been out for just two weeks, creating a storm of excitement and success in the market, yet it hasn't made its debut in the USA and Europe regions. This phased release strategy has only fueled anticipation and eagerness among gamers outside of Japan, who are keenly waiting to dive into the vast, immersive world that WoW promises. In this climate of heightened anticipation, Kishin made a strategic announcement that would further captivate its global audience, Call of Duty and Silent Hill 3, two of the most awaited video games, are set to be released simultaneously in Japan and the USA, with Europe not far behind. This marks a significant shift from WoW's staggered launch, showcasing Kishin's ability to adapt and cater to its international fanbase with more synchronized release strategies. The decision to launch Call of Duty and Silent Hill 3 concurrently in these major markets is a testament to Kishin's logistical capabilities and its commitment to meeting the global demand for its games. Moreover, by planning an earlier release for these titles in Europe compared to WoW, Kishin demonstrates a nuanced understanding of regional gaming trends and preferences, ensuring that European gamers feel prioritized and valued. This approach not only maintains the momentum built by WoW's success but also sets the stage for a global celebration of Kishin's latest offerings. Dash. As Kishin's PC video games continue to captivate gamers worldwide, the company's ventures into the aerospace sector have been progressing steadily, albeit more quietly. Following the tragic events of 9-11 in 2001, Kishin, recognizing the urgent need for enhanced airline and aerospace technologies, embarked on a strategic partnership with both the U.S. and Japanese governments. This collaboration aimed to bolster security measures and advance technological innovations in the field. Leveraging the support from the U.S. government, Kishin's subsidiary, Kishin Aerospace, forged a significant alliance with Orbital Sciences Corporation, a renowned player in the aerospace industry. This joint research and partnership were designed to combine Kishin's technological prowess with Orbital Sciences' expertise in space and satellite technologies, setting the stage for groundbreaking advancements. Now, just a year into the partnership, Kishin Aerospace has made notable strides. The collaboration has yielded innovative security solutions for airports and aircraft, incorporating advanced scanning systems and biometric identification technologies that have set new standards in aviation safety. Beyond security, the partnership has also focused on developing more efficient propulsion systems and lightweight materials for spacecraft, aiming to reduce costs and extend the reach of satellite launches. One of the most ambitious projects underway is the development of a new satellite constellation designed to enhance global communication networks. This initiative promises to bring high-speed internet access to remote areas, bridging the digital divide and fostering global connectivity. Kishin's involvement brings a fresh perspective to aerospace design and functionality, blending their expertise in consumer technology with orbital science's space-bound innovations. Furthermore, Kishin Aerospace has been exploring sustainable energy solutions for aviation, reflecting the company's commitment to environmental responsibility. Research is being conducted into alternative fuel sources and energy-efficient aircraft designs, with the goal of reducing the carbon footprint of air travel. In just a year, Kishin's foray into the aerospace sector has demonstrated the company's versatility and its capacity to contribute significantly to fields beyond gaming. While the aerospace ventures may not capture the public imagination as vividly as their blockbuster video games, Kishin's impact on the industry is profound driving technological advancements that promise to shape the future of air and space travel. Shin harbors an ambitious dream for Kishin Aerospace, inspired by his previous life's admiration for SpaceX. He envisions transforming Kishin Aerospace into a trailblazer in the industry, 
not just contributing to aerospace technology but also venturing into the realm of launching rockets into space. Driven by this ambitious goal, Shin has been strategically steering Kishin Aerospace towards research and development in advanced propulsion systems, spacecraft design, and satellite technology. He believes that by pushing the boundaries of what's currently possible, Kishin Aerospace can play a crucial role in the future of space exploration and commercial spaceflight. Under Shin's leadership, Kishin Aerospace has embarked on projects that lay the groundwork for this vision. This includes investing in reusable rocket technology to reduce the cost of space access, similar to the innovations that have defined SpaceX's approach. Shin is also passionate about the development of spacecraft capable of supporting both cargo missions and human spaceflight, aiming to contribute to humanity's ability to explore and perhaps even inhabit other planets. Moreover, Shin sees the potential for leveraging Kishin's technological expertise to create interconnected satellite networks, providing global internet coverage and enhancing communication across the world. This endeavor not only aligns with his vision of making space more accessible but also serves a broader purpose of bridging technological divides and fostering global connectivity. To realize these ambitious goals, Shin has been cultivating partnerships with other industry leaders, investing in research and development, and recruiting top talents in aerospace engineering and space sciences. He understands the challenges that lie ahead in competing with established entities like SpaceX but remains undeterred driven by a vision of Kishin Aerospace becoming a pioneering force in making space the next frontier for human achievement. Chapter 463, COD and Silent Hill 3 The long-awaited PC and dual-platform video games, Call of Duty and Silent Hill 3, finally hit the shelves, stirring up excitement among gamers everywhere. A group of friends, having eagerly counted down the days to the release, wasted no time heading to their local gaming store in the USA to secure their copies. With palpable enthusiasm, they picked up Call of Duty for PC and the PC version of Silent Hill 3, which interestingly came in a two-disc set, one for PC and another for the KS2 console. Back at one of their homes, they set up camp in the living room, a hub of anticipation and camaraderie. The lights dimmed, creating the perfect gaming ambience, and snacks were scattered across the coffee table, ready for the long night ahead. First up was Call of Duty. The group dove into the game taking turns at the helm, navigating through intense battles and strategic missions. The room was filled with a mix of tense silence during critical moments and bursts of excitement following successful missions. The graphics and compelling storyline had everyone on the edge of their seats, completely absorbed in the action-packed world Kishin had masterfully crafted. As the friends delved deeper into Call of Duty, they began to notice an issue that dampened their gaming experience the game was running at low frames per second FPS, on their computer. The once smooth graphics became choppy, and the fluidity of the gameplay suffered, disrupting the immersive nature of the game and making precise actions more challenging. Is it just me, or is the game lagging? One of the friends asked, pausing after a particularly stuttered firefight. Yeah, I noticed that too, another replied, squinting at the screen. It's definitely not as smooth as it should be. They exchanged concerned glances realizing that their PC might not meet the game's optimal requirements or that their graphics settings were too high for their current setup. The realization was a bit of a letdown, considering their anticipation and the excitement they had for playing the game. Determined not to let this hiccup ruin their night, they ventured into the game's settings, lowering the graphics quality in hopes of achieving a smoother performance. While this improved the FPS slightly, it was a compromise, trading off visual quality for better playability. Despite the setback, the group's spirits remained high. They continued their gaming session, adjusting to the reduced graphics while joking about the need for a PC upgrade. Guess it's time to start saving up for a new graphics card, one of them quipped, eliciting a round of nods and laughter. Even with the lower FPS impacting their gaming experience, the friends' enthusiasm for Call of Duty didn't wane. As they shared jokes about upgrading their PCs, thoughts on how to actually improve their computer setups began to crystallize in their minds. They weren't alone in this predicament. Across the USA, other gamers facing similar issues with the new Kishin video games started searching online for solutions to enhance their gaming rigs. Forums, social media platforms, and dedicated gaming websites were abuzz with discussions on upgrading PCs to meet the demanding requirements of games like Call of Duty. In these online communities, many found a wealth of information on how to properly upgrade their computers. There were step-by-step -step guides, and detailed posts from seasoned gamers who also happened to be professionals in the computer field. These tech-savvy gamers shared their knowledge generously, offering tips on selecting the right components, where to find the best deals, 
and how to assemble the parts for optimal gaming performance. Some posts even detailed specific upgrades tailored to running Kishin's latest releases at high settings, addressing common issues like low FPS and graphical stuttering. From recommendations on the latest graphics cards to advice on CPUs and memory upgrades, the information was comprehensive and geared towards enhancing the gaming experience. Encouraged by this wealth of knowledge, many gamers, including the group of friends, began to plan out their upgrades. They discussed budgets, compared prices and debated the merits of different hardware configurations. For some, this would be their first foray into customizing their PCs, while for others, it was an opportunity to apply their technical skills. Dash. As many gamers delved into Call of Duty, they also turned their attention to Silent Hill 3 on their PCs. However, much like their experience with Call of Duty, they encountered performance issues, the game was running at low frames per second, FPS, detracting from the eerie, immersive experience Silent Hill 3 is known for. This shared challenge led to discussions among friends and online communities. While they were troubleshooting and seeking ways to optimize their PC settings for better performance, a practical piece of advice started circulating, for those who owned a KS2 console, it might be worthwhile to consider purchasing the Silent Hill 3 console version instead. This suggestion stemmed from the fact that the console version was optimized specifically for the KS2, likely offering a smoother and more stable gameplay experience compared to the struggling PC version. This idea resonated with many gamers, especially those already frustrated by their attempts to improve the PC game's FPS. Word of mouth and online endorsements for the KS2 version of Silent Hill 3 began to spread. Gamers shared their positive experiences with the console version, noting the enhanced performance and how it preserved the atmospheric tension crucial to the game's horror experience, unmarred by technical distractions. For many, this switch provided a solution that allowed them to fully dive into the chilling world of Silent Hill 3 without the immersion-breaking interruptions of low FPS. While some still hoped to eventually upgrade their PCs to handle such demanding games, the KS2 offered a reliable alternative for enjoying one of the year's most anticipated titles. As a result of these performance issues, the sales of the Silent Hill 3 console version for the KS2 saw a significant uptick, surpassing those of its PC counterpart. Chapter 464, Distinguish As Kishin's video games continue to excel in the market, its subsidiary in the entertainment film industry, Kishin Pictures, is also making significant strides. The recent releases of Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets and Artemis Fowl, among others, have become blockbusters, solidifying Kishin Pictures' reputation as a powerhouse in the movie industry, comparable to the likes of Warner Brothers or Walt Disney. Beyond films, Kishin has expanded its entertainment empire to theme parks, with Kishin World establishments in various countries including Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, the USA, and South Korea. These theme parks celebrate Kishin's famous intellectual properties, featuring attractions based on beloved video games like Super Mario, The Legend of Zelda, and God of War, as well as popular anime series such as Pokemon, Dragon Ball, One Piece, and Naruto. The parks also incorporate characters and stories from Kishin Pictures films, including Jurassic Park, Harry Potter, Spider-Man, and other Marvel comics, making them a haven for fans. The comprehensive incorporation of Kishin's vast array of intellectual properties into Kishin World has turned these parks into major attractions. They draw in crowds of young people and families, many of whom have a deep-seated love for at least one of Kishin's famous IPS. The park's ability to offer immersive experiences based on these beloved characters and stories has been a key factor in their success. As a result, Kishin World is rapidly gaining popularity and is beginning to rival established giants like Disneyland in terms of visitor numbers and global recognition. Industry experts have analyzed the growth and appeal of Kishin World, predicting that it may soon surpass traditional favorites like Disneyland. This rise is attributed not only to the quality and diversity of the attractions but also to Kishin's unique ability to leverage its successful IPS from both gaming, anime and film, creating a rich, interconnected entertainment experience that resonates with a broad audience. In the year 2002, Disney's theme parks and resorts segment, encompassing Disneyland and other attractions, generated a substantial $6 billion in revenue. Meanwhile, Kishin's equivalent division, which includes the increasingly popular Kishin World, has also seen remarkable financial success, amassing billions of dollars annually. This marks a tremendous upsurge from the mere hundreds of millions in revenue Kishin's theme park ventures were generating in the 1990s. Notably, in 2002, Kishin's revenue from its theme parks and resorts segment, featuring Kishin World, 
closely approached Disney's, reaching an impressive $5.9 billion. Executives at Walt Disney have been closely monitoring Keishin's rapid growth. Originally, when Disney partnered with Keishin for filmmaking ventures in the 1990s, there might have been expectations or even hopes from some within Disney to see Keishin's ventures plateau or decline, potentially setting the stage for an acquisition. However, as time unfolded, Keishin not only maintained its momentum but also began to surpass Disney in terms of global recognition and overall net worth. Keishin's growth trajectory has defied all initial expectations, particularly those of Walt Disney, which once harbored ambitions of acquiring Keishin during periods of potential decline. However, the reality has unfolded quite differently. Following Keishin's strategic acquisition of Pixar, the dynamics shifted dramatically. Now, it is Keishin that is in the position of power, eyeing the possibility of acquiring Walt Disney, turning what once seemed improbable into a tangible prospect. Keishin's ambitions do not stop with Disney. The company has started acquiring shares in other major studios such as Warner Brothers and Universal, signaling its intention to further expand its influence in the entertainment industry, even contemplating outright purchases from their parent companies. This aggressive expansion strategy signaled Keishin's intent to not just participate in but dominate the global entertainment landscape. This shift has not gone unnoticed by the executives and CEOs of these influential studios. Once, they may have viewed Keishin with disdain and skepticism, underestimating the company's potential due to its smaller size and different market focus. Now, they find themselves confronting a new reality where Keishin has emerged as a formidable force, capable of challenging and possibly even overtaking their long-established dominions. Keishin's ascent has, therefore, become a source of concern for these executives. They are now faced with the prospect of competing against or possibly being absorbed by a company they once underestimated. This transformation of Keishin from an underdog to a titan of the entertainment industry has forced a re-evaluation of strategies and a recognition of Keishin's prowess and ambition. The tables have indeed turned, with Keishin now commanding a position of influence and power that few could have anticipated. What caught the attention of many and significantly catapulted Keishin to global influence and recognition, beyond its successes in video games and entertainment, was due to its revolutionary product that Keishin announced with Apple a few months ago the iPhone. The anticipation for the iPhone's launch has been unparalleled. Consumers worldwide have been keenly following every update, eager to get their hands on what promises to be a revolutionary device. Though the price of the iPhone has yet to be officially announced, the excitement and expectation surrounding its release have led many to begin saving up, wanting to ensure they can be among the first to experience the device. This widespread eagerness underscores the significant impact the announcement has had on Keishin's image and standing on the global stage. Chapter 465, Recent PC Game Acclaim In the days following the release of Call of Duty and Silent Hill 3, the gaming community was abuzz, flooding forums and the pages of video game magazines with diverse opinions and analyses of the two titles. Players who dived into Call of Duty expressed high praise, feeling as though they had been catapulted into historical conflicts. Each mission offered not just a challenge but an educational journey, blending entertainment with a touch of historical learning. Critics extolled the game for its engrossing narrative and state-of-the-art graphics, setting a new standard for realism in gaming. The acclaim was widespread, with numerous video game publications and online critics heralding Call of Duty for pushing the boundaries of storytelling and visual fidelity. However, alongside the accolades, there came critiques. A common point of contention was the game's demanding requirements. Critics pointed out that Call of Duty required a robust PC setup to run smoothly. Gamers with less powerful systems experienced issues like bugs and freezing, detracting from the otherwise immersive experience. This requirement for high-end hardware was a barrier for some, leading to a mixed reception among the community. Despite these criticisms, the game's impact and achievements in redefining historical gaming were undeniable. While Silent Hill 3 may not share the same historical gravitas praised in Call of Duty, it has nevertheless captured significant attention in its own right, thanks in large part to the Silent Hill series' already established and fervent fan base. Praise for Silent Hill 3 has centered around its masterful continuation of the series' legacy of psychological horror. Critics and players alike have lauded its deeply atmospheric world, filled with unsettling environments that blur the lines between reality and nightmare. The game's narrative, rich with dark themes and complex characters, has been celebrated for its ability to engage players emotionally, drawing them into its twisted tale. Additionally, the soundtrack and sound design have received acclaim for their role in heightening the sense of dread and suspense, proving once again that audio is a crucial component of effective horror. However, like Call of Duty, 
Silent Hill 3 faced its share of critiques. Reviewers delved into the game, pinpointing aspects that didn't quite meet their standards. A significant point of contention, mirroring the criticism of Call of Duty, was the demanding PC requirements needed to run Silent Hill 3 smoothly. However, this issue found a solution in the game's availability on the console platform, KS2. The KS2 console has been gaining traction, appealing not just to younger gamers but also to the older generation across various countries. It has become a source of entertainment that bridges the gap between different age groups. In an interesting shift, young console gamers in some regions, including the USA, have started to notice their parents whether fathers or mothers getting engrossed in KS2 gaming sessions. Among these parental gamers, titles like God of War and Metal Gear Solid I have become favorites, often with fathers showing a particular affinity for these games. Meanwhile, Silent Hill 2, and now Silent Hill 3, have carved out their niche among mothers. The release of Silent Hill 3 on the KS2 has only bolstered its popularity among this demographic, demonstrating the game's wide appeal. While God of War and Metal Gear Solid I continue to captivate dads, Silent Hill 2 and Silent Hill 3 have become hits with moms, showcasing the diverse interests and inclusivity within the KS2 gaming community. Dash. Max, a dedicated young gamer, had been eagerly awaiting his turn to dive into the chilling world of Silent Hill 3 on the family's KS2 console. Imagine his surprise when he found his mother, Sarah, deeply engrossed in the game instead. Mom? You're playing Silent Hill 3? Max asked, his voice a mix of astonishment and disappointment. Sarah, without taking her eyes off the screen, responded, Oh, Max. Yes, I just started, and it's incredibly gripping. I can't believe I waited this long to give it a try. But. I've been waiting to play it all week, Max sighed feeling a twinge of frustration. I'm sorry, honey. I had no idea you were waiting. You know, you could join me. We could take turns, Sarah suggested, sensing her son's disappointment. Max shook his head, it's okay, mom. I'll let you play. I'll find something else to do. With a sense of resignation, Max left the room to meet his friends at their usual hangout. Once there, he shared his unexpected discovery with them. You won't believe this, but my mom has hijacked the KS2. She's totally into Silent Hill 3 now, Max explained. To his surprise, a couple of his friends had similar stories to share. Yeah, my mom's been on a Silent Hill 2 marathon for days. Looks like our KS2 is off limits for a while, laughed Rick, shaking his head in disbelief. Ella chimed in, same here. My mom discovered Silent Hill 2 last week, and she's been glued to the KS2 ever since. I had no idea she was into gaming like that. The group shared a laugh, finding their shared predicament quite funny. It was clear the KS2 and the Silent Hill series had unexpectedly bridged generations, bringing their parents into the gaming fold. After a moment, Max had an idea, hey, why don't we all play Counter-Strike together online? We can use our home family PCs. His friends nodded in agreement, excited by the suggestion. Sounds like a plan. At least our PCs are still under our control, Rick said with a grin. And just like that, the young gamers found a new way to enjoy their gaming passion together, turning to their PCs for a Counter-Strike session. Despite their initial disappointment, the group quickly found a silver lining. They decided to switch gears and gather around their home PCs instead. United by their shared situation, they dove into online matches of Counter-Strike, turning their thwarted console gaming plans into an unexpected multiplayer session. This shift not only kept their spirits high but also brought them closer together, proving that sometimes, a change of plans can lead to new and enjoyable experiences. Chapter 466, Nearing Launch As the launch date for the iPhone 1 approached, Kishin was a hive of activity. This was a pivotal moment for the company, which had been known for its dominance in gaming and entertainment, as it prepared to make a bold leap into the territory of the cell phone market a market yet to experience a device like the one they were poised to release. In the lead-up to the release, Kishin's engineering teams were in a constant flurry of activity. Day and night, they carried out extensive testing and quality assurance checks. Every detail of the iPhone 1 was scrutinized, its sleek design, intuitive user interface, groundbreaking features and software stability were all put under the microscope to ensure they met Kishin's exacting standards. Parallel to these technical efforts, the marketing department was buzzing with creativity. Under the guidance of Shin, who brought with him a wealth of knowledge from his previous life, 
including successful strategies employed by Apple, the team crafted compelling advertising campaigns. They aimed to ignite the public's curiosity and build anticipation with teaser ads and promotional materials, all carefully timed to maximize impact. Shin's insights were instrumental, shaping campaigns that resonated with potential customers and set the stage for a successful launch. On another front, logistics and retail planning were in full swing. The logistics team collaborated closely with distributors and retail partners, smoothing out every detail to ensure a seamless introduction of the iPhone 1 to the market. Plans were meticulously laid out for inventory management, shipping, and visual merchandising in stores, ensuring that upon release, the iPhone 1 would be within easy reach of eager customers. Meanwhile, retail employees were thoroughly briefed and trained, armed with all the information they needed to inform and excite shoppers about this groundbreaking new product. As launch day neared, Anticipation within Kishin and among the awaiting public reached a fever pitch. The culmination of months of hard work was about to be unveiled, and the sense of expectation was palpable. In Japan, a nation known for its economic strength and tech-savvy citizens, the allure of Kishin's iPhone ads and teasers was undeniable. People from all walks of life, young and old, found themselves captivated by the promise of this new device. The country's strong buying power meant that even high prices weren't an automatic deterrent for the eager consumers. On forums like Yahoo and Kishin's own website, discussions about the iPhone were buzzing with excitement. Users exchanged comments in real time, with one exclaiming, Have you seen how responsive the iPhone's touchscreen is? It's incredible. I can't believe we're getting something so innovative. Another user added, echoing the collective amazement. However, when Kishin unveiled the iPhone's pricing 60,000 yen for the 4GB model and 72,000 yen for the 8GB version the community's reaction was mixed. In a university classroom, a lively discussion unfolded. A female student raised a concern, 60 to 72,000 yen? Isn't that too steep? A male classmate chuckled in response, I think it's reasonable. Look around, all other phones just have keypads. The iPhone is a game changer with its smooth touchscreen, internet connectivity and multimedia capabilities it's like nothing else out there. She nodded, albeit still uncertain, I know but 72,000 yen for 8 GB? I could buy a decent laptop for that. Another peer chimed in, but can your laptop fit in your pocket? Does it have a touch screen that lets you navigate with just a tap? The room buzzed with nods and murmurs of agreement. Exactly, another student added, while a laptop has its perks, it can't compete with the convenience of an iPhone. It fits right in our pockets, offering so many features in such a small package. The conversation reflected a broader sentiment felt across Japan and beyond. The iPhone's compact design, combined with its cutting-edge features, made it a subject of fascination and desire. People were not just discussing a phone, they were talking about a revolution in technology, a leap into a future where a device in their pocket could do almost everything a computer could. This widespread fascination wasn't just limited to tech enthusiasts or the younger generation. It was a phenomenon that crossed age groups and social strata. And behind this groundbreaking device was Kishin, a company that had now proven itself capable of not just competing in the global tech arena but leading it, creating a product that captured the world's imagination. The conversation around the iPhone 1 was more than about a gadget, it was about the dawn of a new era in personal technology. Kishin has kept the exact release date of their iPhone under wraps, simply stating that it will be available anytime soon a phrase that could mean a matter of days or weeks. Despite the lack of a specific date, Anticipation has reached such heights that people have already started queuing outside Kishin stores in Tokyo. This unusual sight has not gone unnoticed, capturing the attention of various media outlets which have been covering the growing lines outside the stores. Meanwhile, those waiting in line outside the Kishin stores are united by a common hope, that the launch of the iPhone is just a few days away rather than a few weeks. The air is filled with a mix of excitement and impatience as they speculate and chat among themselves about the potential features and innovations the iPhone might bring. Chapter 467, iPhone I In a bustling electronics store in downtown Tokyo, two friends, Hisao and Kiichi, browsed the latest gadgets, their conversation naturally drifting to the topic of the newly announced iPhone. Have you seen the price for the new iPhone? Hisao asked, a hint of disbelief in his voice. Kiichi nodded, scrolling through his current phone a model known for its flippable design and color screen that had cost him a small fortune. Yeah. I expected it to be way more expensive, especially with all the hype around it. Hisao leaned closer, comparing the sleek image of the iPhone on the poster to Kiichi's bulky handset. Exactly. 
People are complaining, but think about it our phones were almost 100,000 yen, and they're nowhere near as advanced as the iPhone. Kiichi chuckled, flipping his phone open and shut absent-mindedly. You're right. Mine doesn't even have half the features, and the internet is so slow. Yet, I paid top yen for this just because of its color screen and brand. Hisao gestured excitedly. And that's just it. The iPhone's starting price is what, 60,000 yen for the 4GB model? For something that lets you browse the web like a computer, listen to music, and even navigate maps? It's a steal. Kiichi sighed, putting his outdated phone back into his pocket. When you put it like that, it really puts things into perspective. I thought it was pricey at first, but compared to what we got for more money, the iPhone seems like a bargain. The two friends shared a knowing look, a mix of regret for their past purchases and excitement for what lay ahead. Well, Hisao said with a decisive nod, I know where my next paycheck is going. While the iPhone's price tag raised eyebrows among some consumers in Japan, labeling it as steep, there was a significant portion of the population that actually found the cost surprisingly reasonable, especially compared to their initial expectations. After all, the market was already filled with high-end phones, sporting basic designs and keypads, tagged at prices upwards of 70,000 yen to 100,000 yen. These devices, often lauded for features as simple as colored screens and flip capabilities, paled in comparison to the iPhone's innovative offerings. Many consumers saw the iPhone not just as a phone but as a multifunctional device that promised far more than making calls and sending texts. In their eyes, paying a similar price for something vastly superior in functionality and design especially when compared to the pricier, yet less sophisticated models currently available seemed like a bargain. Dash. A few restless days had trickled by, with hopeful individuals already queuing up outside Kishin stores, fueled by the fervent wish that the iPhone would make its grand debut ahead of schedule. Their patience and dedication were not in vain. Just a few hours ago, to the jubilation of those waiting, Kishin made the announcement they had all been eagerly anticipating, the iPhone was officially on sale. As the news spread like wildfire, the lines snaking outside Kishin stores grew exponentially. People from all walks of life, some who had camped out for days and others who had rushed over upon hearing the news, stood together in anticipation. Their shared goal was clear to lay their hands on the iPhone, a device they believed would redefine their connectivity, productivity, and entertainment. The scene outside the Kishin stores was nothing short of spectacular, a testament to the iPhone's allure and the impact of Kishin's innovative leap into the cell phone market. Cameras flashed and reporters jostled for the best spots, capturing the excitement and eagerness of the crowd. This moment of technological fervor wasn't only to local news, international media outlets also picked up the story, broadcasting images of the enthusiastic crowds lining up in Tokyo to a global audience. Viewers around the world watched as the first customers emerged from the stores, iPhones in hand, their expressions a mix of triumph and awe. Interviews conducted with those in line revealed a spectrum of emotions from the sheer excitement of tech enthusiasts to the curious optimism of everyday consumers looking forward to exploring the iPhone's capabilities. Dash. In the dimly lit confines of his spacious office, the CEO of Motorola sat before the television, his eyes fixed on the screen, reflecting the vibrant imagery of the Kishin store's grand opening. The live broadcast showed the jubilant face of the first person worldwide to purchase an iPhone, holding it aloft like a trophy for all to see. The scene was celebratory, but the atmosphere in the CEO's office was starkly different. With a solemn expression etched on his face, he watched the scene unfold, a deep sense of foreboding settling in his chest. The iPhone's sleek design, its innovative features, and the palpable excitement of the consumers were all too clear indicators of the shifting sands in the mobile phone market. As the cheers from the television echoed through the silent office, the CEO leaned back in his chair, lost in thought. Kishin, a company known for its dominance in gaming and entertainment, had now ventured into his domain, presenting a challenge he hadn't fully anticipated. Until now, Kishin's presence in this space had been notable but not dominant, they had lingered as the fourth-ranking company, ambitious but not yet fully realized in the telecommunications sphere. The weight of the moment was not lost on him, the Kishin iPhone could very well steal the title of the number one cell phone brand in the market, a title that Motorola had held for years. It was a wake-up call, a clear signal that the mobile phone industry was evolving and that Motorola would need to innovate or be left behind. As the broadcast continued, showing ecstatic customers streaming into the Kishin store, the CEO Christopher turned off the television, the screen going dark. Christopher massaged his temples, a headache throbbing behind his eyes. Ever since the announcement of the iPhone, 
Motorola had been in a frenzy, trying to chart a new course that would allow them to produce something akin to Kishin's groundbreaking device. They had entertained the idea of creating a phone to rival the iPhone, but the reality was proving to be far more complex than initially anticipated. Developing an operating system comparable to what the iPhone boasted seemed like a Herculean task. The initial estimates suggested it could take years, a timeline that filled Christopher with a sense of urgency and frustration. As the CEO, the weight of these decisions rested heavily on his shoulders. He couldn't help but marvel, albeit grudgingly, at Kishin's achievement. How did Kishin manage to pull this off? He muttered to himself, pacing the confines of his office. The seamless integration, the intuitive design, the sheer innovation of the iPhone it all seemed leagues ahead of anything currently on the market. Chapter 468, iPhone 2 Much like Motorola, other major phone brands such as Suzuki, Tora, and Samstar found themselves equally captivated and confounded by Kishin's achievement with the iPhone. Executives from these companies, each a titan in their own right, were left marveling at the sophistication and innovation of Kishin's new product. A common consensus emerged among them, Kishin must have been dedicating years of secret research and development to bring the iPhone to fruition. A wave of self-reproach swept through the boardrooms of these competing brands. They lamented their oversight, questioning why the idea of integrating touchscreen technology with a host of other features, much like the iPhone, hadn't occurred to them years earlier. Instead, they had remained tethered to the traditional keypad phone models, even as touchscreen technology began making its presence known within the market. This stubborn adherence to the old ways wasn't due to a lack of awareness but a strategic decision. Kishin had already been making strides in touchscreen technology, but Suzuki, Tora, and Samstar had been reluctant to adopt this new tech, primarily to avoid paying licensing fees to Kishin. Their strategy had been to prioritize their immediate profits, avoiding any reliance on Kishin's innovations, assuming they could sustain their market positions with their existing technologies. However, this strategy now seemed short-sighted. The release of the iPhone was a wake-up call, underscoring a missed opportunity and a misjudgment of the market's direction. The reluctance to embrace new technology, to pay the necessary fees for a groundbreaking feature, had left them trailing in Kishin's wake. Now, as they witnessed Kishin potentially reshaping the mobile landscape, these executives couldn't help but acknowledge the miscalculation. Kishin had seized the moment, capitalizing on an opportunity they had all overlooked. The realization was bitter, their previous focus on maintaining high profit margins at the expense of innovation had indeed backfired. As the market buzzed with excitement over the iPhone, these companies understood that the path to dominance had irrevocably shifted, with Kishin now leading the charge. The race to catch up was on, and the stakes had never been higher. Dash. In the bustling corridors of their school, Shinichi's classmate, Isabi Yutaka, who came from a wealthy family, had become the center of attention. Just yesterday, he had acquired the much-coveted iPhone, and now, he was more than eager to flaunt it before his peers. As his classmates gathered around, Drawn by the novelty of the device, Yutaka took pride in demonstrating its capabilities. He showcased how effortlessly the iPhone could play music, along with popular KSP games like Flappy Bird and Angry Birds, all available through the Kishin store for download. The group marveled at the iPhone's ability to access and download video games directly, a feature that seemed almost magical in its simplicity and innovation. Meanwhile, Shinichi and his close friends, Arnold, Ryo, Satoshi, and Takeshi, looked on with a mix of amusement and mild irritation at Yutaka's showboating. Arnold, trying to mask his envy, mentioned offhandedly, my dad was supposed to get me an iPhone too, but they were all sold out. Ryo, Satoshi, and Takeshi quickly chimed in, their determination clear. We're going to get one too, no matter what. We'll just have to convince our parents to find a store that hasn't sold out yet. We'll search everywhere if we have to. Amidst this fervor, Shinichi could only offer a wry chuckle. He watched his friends get caught up in the excitement, envying Yutaka for his latest acquisition. Shinichi knew he could easily secure iPhones for them all, given that Kishin was his father's empire. Yet, he hesitated. Revealing his identity as the son of the affluent and influential Shinro of Kishin could alter his friends' perceptions of him, potentially changing the dynamic of their friendship forever. The dilemma weighed heavily on Shinichi. The thought of his friends treating him differently or expecting special treatment simply because of his family's wealth was unsettling. Shinichi mulled over a compromise that could assist his friends without unveiling his status. He contemplated asking his father for a discreet favor to arrange a limited number of iPhones to be made available at a specific gadget store, creating an illusion that they were simply unsold stock, 
overlooked by the masses. This store, Shinichi would suggest to his friends, was a hidden gem where the sought-after device was still available, bypassing the frenzied rush and sold-out statuses elsewhere. With this plan forming in his mind, Shinichi approached his friends with a casual air. Hey, I heard about this store that still has iPhones in stock. It's not very popular, so not many people shop there, he mentioned, trying to sound as nonchalant as possible. His friends exchanged skeptical looks. Arnold raised an eyebrow. Really? In this craze? That sounds too good to be true. Yeah, Satoshi chimed in, every place is sold out. Are you sure? Shinichi nodded, maintaining his composure. Yeah, I'm sure. How about we all go check it out tomorrow? You might get lucky. Despite their initial doubts, the group agreed to take their chances. After all, the prospect of getting their hands on an iPhone without the usual hassle was too tempting to pass up. They decided to accompany Shinichi to the store he mentioned, their curiosity peaked and their hopes cautiously rising. Chapter 469, Uncle The sun cast a warm glow over the city as Shinichi and his friends approached the gadget store he had mentioned the day before. His friends, their expressions a mix of excitement and skepticism, followed closely behind. Are you sure about this, Shinichi? Ryo asked, a note of doubt in his voice as they neared the entrance. Shinichi, maintaining his composure, replied with quiet confidence, just trust me, guys. Let's go in and check it out. As they entered the store, they were greeted by the store owner, a man with an amiable demeanor and knowing eyes. Shinichi gave a subtle nod, a prearranged signal between them. Welcome, greeted the owner warmly. How can I assist you today? We're here for the iPhones, Shinichi replied, as if it were the most natural thing in the world. His friends exchanged surprised glances, still taking in the store's quiet ambience so different from the chaotic scenes they had anticipated. The owner, recognized by Shinichi as Shiru Yu, his father's elder second brother and Shinichi's uncle, smiled knowingly and gestured towards a display case. You're in luck. We have a few units left. The group moved closer, their eyes widening as they saw the neatly arranged iPhone boxes. The disbelief was palpable among them, it was a stark contrast to the sold-out signs and long queues they had expected. Shiryu noticed their hesitation and opened one of the boxes, revealing the sleek iPhone inside. Please, feel free to examine them. They're all genuine. Arnold tentatively reached out, picking up the device and turning it on. The screen lit up, the Kishin familiar logo greeting them. The reality of the situation began to sink and these were indeed real iPhones, just as Shinichi had promised. Wow, I can't believe this, Satoshi exclaimed his earlier doubts fading away as he inspected another iPhone from the box. Takeshi, still in a state of mild shock, added, I thought it was too good to be true. Shinichi, how did you even find this place? Shinichi merely smiled, opting not to reveal the full extent of his connection to the store. Just heard about it from, someone I know, he said vaguely. His friends, now buzzing with excitement, turned their attention back to the iPhones their initial skepticism forgotten in the face of the undeniable reality before them. They began discussing which models to buy, their voices filled with enthusiasm and relief. After securing their coveted iPhones, Shinichi's friends were eager to leave the store, their excitement to explore their new gadgets palpable. They quickly thanked the store owner for his assistance and hurried out, leaving Shinichi behind for a brief moment. Once his friends had stepped out, Shinichi turned back to Shiryu, his uncle, and offered a deep, respectful bow. Thank you, Uncle Shiryu, for your help today, he said, his gratitude genuine. Shiryu, before assuming his role at Kishin, was renowned as a famous singer, captivating audiences with his performances in previous years. Transitioning from his musical career, he became the CEO of Kishin Entertainment in 1999, leveraging his industry knowledge and charisma to manage and nurture the company's burgeoning talents. Shiryu chuckled, a warm, affectionate sound that filled the small store. Shinichi, you're quite something, you know that? Going through all this trouble just to help your friends, he teased, his eyes twinkling with amusement. Shinichi merely offered a modest smile in response, his demeanor calm. It's the least I could do for them, he replied, the simplicity of his statement underscoring the depth of his loyalty to his friends. The two shared a few more words, a comfortable exchange that reflected their familial bond. After a short while, sensing that his friends would be waiting, Shinichi bowed once more to his uncle. I should catch up with them. 
Thank you again, uncle. I'll visit soon, he promised, his voice carrying a mix of respect and affection. With a final nod from Shiryu, Shinichi turned and left the store, the bell above the door chiming softly behind him. As he stepped into the sunlight, catching sight of his friends who were already immersed in their new iPhones, a sense of contentment settled over him. Upon reconnecting with his friends, Shinichi discovered that each of them had already acquired their own iPhones, courtesy of their parents who had provided them with the funds before their venture to the store. Together, they decided to explore the capabilities of their new devices at Arnold's house, where they could connect to the WorldCom Kishin Wi-Fi for a more immersive experience. As they delved into the Kishin store, loaded with anticipation, they were greeted by an array of video games. Familiar titles like Flappy Bird and Angry Birds reminded them of fun times spent on the KSP, but now these games promised a new touchscreen experience. Their curiosity peaked when they stumbled across Temple Run, a game none of them had played before. Without hesitation, they each downloaded it, their excitement palpable during the wait. Once downloaded, the group dived into the game simultaneously, each person engrossed in their own screen. The vibrant graphics and fluid motion captivated them as they navigated their characters through the perilous temple environment. Wow, look at how smooth it is to slide and jump. Arnold marveled, his character deftly avoiding obstacles. It's like you're really there, running for your life. Ryo commented, barely looking up from his screen. Satoshi and Takeshi were equally engrossed, their fingers swiping with precision as they collected coins and power UPS. This is amazing, Satoshi breathed, completely absorbed. Takeshi laughed, thrilled by the chase, I can't believe how addictive this is. While engrossed in their games, the serene atmosphere of Arnold's room was suddenly interrupted as Julia, Arnold's mom, stepped in. Her eyes widened in surprise upon seeing each of the boys with their own iPhones, devices she knew were in high demand and hard to secure so quickly after release. Chapter 470, Phenomenon Across the World Julia's surprise was evident, she hadn't expected them to acquire iPhones so swiftly. My goodness, you all got one already! Julia exclaimed, her voice tinged with astonishment as she set the tray down on a nearby table. Arnold, slightly annoyed at the interruption of his game, tried to protest as his mom reached for his iPhone. Mom, I'm in the middle of... But Julia, with a playful shush, silenced him. Her curiosity about the iPhone outweighed her son's complaints. As she held the device, turning it over in her hands, she marveled at its sleek design a stark contrast to her keypad cell phone. This is so different, she murmured, her fingers tentatively exploring the touchscreen interface. The fluidity of swiping and tapping was new to her, a far cry from the buttons she was used to pressing. Arnold, now watching his mom navigate his iPhone, couldn't help but smile at her fascination. It's called a touchscreen. Mom. You can do everything with just a swipe or a tap, he explained. Julia's eyes widened in wonder as she discovered the ease of accessing different features, her initial trepidation giving way to excitement. This is amazing, she said, her voice filled with genuine admiration. It's like something from the future. The room filled with laughter as Julia continued to explore the iPhone, asking questions and expressing her amazement at every new discovery. Dash. Even days after its release, the iPhone continued to dominate discussions throughout Japan, maintaining its status as the hottest topic in town. Long lines of eager customers still snaked around Kishin stores, a testament to the unrelenting hype surrounding this groundbreaking device. In private homes, new iPhone owners treated the unboxing experience with a reverence typically reserved for rare treasures. Some even recorded the process, carefully peeling away the packaging to reveal the sleek device inside, aware of the significance of the moment. These videos, shared online, added to the fervor, showcasing the iPhone's elegant design and advanced features, further fueling the desire among those still waiting to purchase one. Although the videos posted were of low quality, they were the only ones suitable for the current internet speeds. Even renowned Japanese manga authors, such as Iikairo Oda of One Piece, Masato of Naruto, and Kira Toriyama of Dragon Ball, were spotted in public with iPhones in hand. This alone highlighted the significant impact of the iPhone, showcasing its widespread appeal across different demographics. The sight of such influential cultural figures adopting this new technology underscored the iPhone's status as a revolutionary device, further cementing its influence and desirability in the eyes of the public. But the phenomenon was not confined to Japan alone. Around the world, people watched with keen interest as the Japanese market was swept up in iPhone mania. International media outlets and newspapers were quick to pick up on the story, 
highlighting the iPhone's potential to revolutionize the cell phone market. Reports emphasized how, in a landscape dominated by keypad-based phones with simple user interfaces, the iPhone stood out dramatically. Its touch screen, sophisticated UI and plethora of features marked a significant departure from the norm, suggesting a seismic shift in what consumers would expect from their mobile devices moving forward. The global anticipation was palpable, especially in the USA and parts of Europe, where consumers were eager to experience this innovation firsthand. The promise of the iPhone had elevated the very concept of what a cell phone could be, setting a new standard that resonated worldwide. People from different corners of the globe found themselves united in their anticipation, counting down the days until the iPhone would be available in their own countries. Dash. Customers in Japan who purchased the iPhone were thoroughly impressed by its array of features. Beyond just listening to music, they could enjoy a variety of functions that were previously unheard of in one device. These included browsing the internet at a good speed, managing emails on the go, capturing high-quality photos, navigating through maps, and organizing their daily schedules with enhanced calendar and note-taking apps. The ability to play games and download new titles from the Kishin App Store added a new dimension to their mobile experience, transforming their iPhone into a portable entertainment hub. Among friends and family, proud new iPhone owners didn't hesitate to showcase the capabilities of their cutting-edge devices. Demonstrations of its sleek touchscreen interface and the multitude of available apps often left their peers in awe. This boasting, while sometimes light-hearted, sparked a sense of envy among those who didn't yet own one. Witnessing the iPhone's revolutionary features and user-friendly design firsthand drove many to decide they, too, needed to own this groundbreaking device, leading to a ripple effect of iPhone purchases fueled by a blend of admiration and envy. Competing companies, left to speculate due to the lack of public sales data from Kishin, estimated that the tech giant had earned billions of yen from the iPhone launch in just a week or so. This estimation was based on the observable consumer demand, the extensive media coverage, and the long lines of eager customers outside Kishin stores. Despite not having access to the exact sales figures, the visible market response and the buzz surrounding the iPhone led these competitors to conclude that Kishin's foray into the cell phone market had yielded significant financial success. Dash. 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 Authors note, I know this comes a bit late, but I want to extend a heartfelt rest in peace to Akira Toriyama, one of my favorite manga authors. His life and work have been incredibly meaningful to so many of us. Thank you, Toriyama-san, for gifting the world with Dragon Ball, Dr. Slump, Chrono Trigger, and so much more. Your incredible creations live on and continue to inspire. Your legacy is immortal, forever etched in our hearts and memories. You will always be alive in the worlds you've created and in the hearts of your fans. Rest well. Person with folded hands. Comment. To comment. Vote. Chapter 471, iPhone's Impact. In the boardroom of a leading cell phone manufacturer, executives gathered around a sleek, polished table. The atmosphere was tense, a stark contrast to the usual buzz of confident strategy discussions. At the head of the table, the CEO, Christopher, cleared his throat, his eyes scanning the room filled with anxious faces. Have we all seen the latest estimates on Kishin's profits? He began, his voice steady despite the clear concern in his eyes. Yes, replied the CFO, flipping open a folder to reveal a series of graphs and numbers. It's far beyond what anyone expected. They're making billions of yen from iPhone sales in just a few days. It's unprecedented. Murmurs of disbelief rippled through the room as the magnitude of Kishin's success sank in. The head of sales chimed in, a hint of frustration in her tone, and our sales? They've plummeted. Ever since the iPhone hit the market, our numbers have been in freefall. It's not just us it's every brand that isn't Kishin. A younger executive, known for his analytical skills, leaned forward, the public's reaction to the iPhone, it's like nothing we've ever seen before. Our models can't compete with a device that's essentially redefining what a phone can be. The room fell silent for a moment, the reality of their situation settling in. The CEO, after a thoughtful pause, spoke up again, this is a wake-up call. Kishin has changed the game completely. Nods of agreement followed his words. Even though the iPhone had only been released in Japan, its impact was so profound that it began affecting the sales of phone brands globally or more accurately, in many countries. The revolutionary features and sleek design of the iPhone set a new standard that existing models couldn't match, leading to a noticeable shift in consumer interest and behavior. As a result, many phone brands started to feel the panic set in. 
executives and teams across the globe watched nervously as their sales numbers began to decline, a direct response to the iPhone's rising popularity. Dash. Even before the launch of the iPhone, many phone brands had been reaching out to Kishin, seeking potential partnerships or opportunities for development within the iPhone framework. They recognized early on the transformative potential the iPhone held and were eager to explore collaborative avenues. Now, after the iPhone had been on the market for some time, the volume of these inquiries significantly increased. More phone brands, witnessing the undeniable impact of the iPhone and its market reception, were contacting Kishin for potential collaboration. The success of the iPhone had sent ripples through the industry, prompting even more companies to reconsider their positions and strategies. They hoped that by aligning with Kishin, they could tap into the innovative technology and user experience that the iPhone offered, aiming to regain their footing in a market that had been dramatically reshaped by Kishin's pioneering product. Meanwhile, there were other phone brands that were not ready to compromise or collaborate with Kishin, determined to maintain their independence and market position. Leading brands like Motorola and Tora stood firm in their resolve. Over at Tora, expert teams of engineers and developers had been assembled to dissect and examine the iPhone in detail. They delved into extensive research, aiming to understand the intricacies that made the iPhone a market sensation. As their investigation progressed, the complexity of the iPhone became increasingly apparent. The Tora experts were particularly struck by the seamless integration of hardware and software in the iPhone. It wasn't just about the individual components being advanced, it was how they worked together so fluidly to create a user experience that was both intuitive and powerful. The multi-touch interface, a novelty at the time, was brilliantly implemented, allowing for gestures and interactions that were previously unimaginable on a mobile device. Furthermore, the operating system itself was a marvel of engineering. Its ability to support a wide range of applications while maintaining speed and stability was unlike anything Tora's team had encountered in their own products. The ecosystem that Kishin had built around the iPhone, including the App Store, was another area of complexity. It wasn't just a marketplace for applications, it was an entire platform that encouraged innovation and diversity, significantly expanding the iPhone's functionality. As Tora's experts continued their research, they also noted the iPhone's aesthetic design, which did not compromise on functionality. The sleek, minimalist approach was combined with high-quality materials, setting a new standard for what consumers would expect from their phones. The culmination of their research left Tora's teams both impressed and overwhelmed. The iPhone's combination of advanced technology, user-centered design, and a robust ecosystem was a significant departure from the industry norms. This realization underscored the challenge ahead for Tora and other brands, to compete, they would need to innovate at every level, rethinking not just their devices but the entire user experience they aimed to provide. As the depth of the iPhone's innovation became clear, the teams of experts and professionals within these phone brands reached a pivotal conclusion. The complexity and sophistication of the iPhone underscored a level of advancement they had yet to achieve independently. Faced with the monumental task of catching up, these teams began to advocate for a new approach, collaboration with Kishin. They proposed that their companies set aside competitive instincts in favor of partnership opportunities with Kishin. Recognizing the potential benefits of such collaborations, they argued that joining forces could provide access to the groundbreaking technologies and design philosophies that had made the iPhone a success. This, in turn, would enable them to innovate more rapidly and effectively, enhancing their own products and potentially sharing in the success Kishin had achieved. These suggestions marked a significant shift in strategy for brands that had long prided themselves on their independence and innovation. Chapter 472, Kishin App Store Market for Video Games The teams and experts at Kishin's phone department found themselves inundated with inquiries and partnership requests from various companies in the wake of the iPhone's success. As the industry recognized the transformative impact of Kishin's technologies, competitors were now eager to become business partners, hoping to license cutting-edge innovations such as Kishin's proprietary chip, the multi-touch technology, and the sophisticated operating system that were central to the iPhone's appeal. The Mobile Technology and Partnership Division, a specialized team within Kishin, was primarily responsible for handling these external inquiries and negotiations. This group, composed of seasoned engineers, business strategists, and legal experts, was tasked with evaluating each partnership request. They had to determine which collaborations could be beneficial while protecting Kishin's intellectual property and maintaining its competitive edge. Shin had anticipated this surge of interest from competing companies wanting to license the iPhone's core technologies. He understood the strategic value of these technologies and the significant advantage they provided Kishin in the market. 
True to his foresight and strategic thinking, Shin was not inclined to allow other companies access to the iPhone's core innovations, such as its proprietary chip, multi-touch technology, or its sophisticated operating system. However, Shin was also aware of the potential benefits of fostering a broader ecosystem and maintaining positive relations within the industry. Instead of flatly denying the requests for partnerships, he decided to offer an alternative that could be mutually beneficial. He directed his teams to provide these companies with hope and an opportunity through Kishin's research and development in the Android operating system. Shin proposed that instead of licensing the iPhone's specific technologies, these companies could collaborate with Kishin on the development and adaptation of a customized Android OS. This would enable them to create competitive products without directly accessing the proprietary innovations that set the iPhone apart. By doing so, Shin aimed to create a win-win situation maintaining Kishin's technological lead while fostering an environment of collaboration and innovation within the industry. Under Shin's guidance, Kishin's R&D teams were prepared to work with these companies, providing support and expertise to help them navigate the Android ecosystem. This approach not only solidified Kishin's position as a leader and innovator but also ensured that the company remained at the center of technological advancements in the mobile industry. Upon hearing Kishin's counter-proposal regarding the Android development collaboration, reactions among the competing companies varied significantly. Many felt that Kishin's reluctance to license out their iPhone's core technologies was a sign of unwillingness to truly collaborate. Feeling slighted or doubting the potential benefits of working on an Android-based system under Kishin's guidance, they decided to back out, unwilling to engage in what they perceived as a one-sided partnership. These companies, disillusioned by Kishin's stance, began to look inward or towards each other, formulating plans to develop their own mobile technologies. They aimed to create products that could rival the iPhone, hoping to replicate its success by developing their own software and operating systems. However, the task was daunting, requiring significant investment and innovation to even approach the benchmarks set by the iPhone. Meanwhile, Shin, the strategic chairman of Kishin, remained undisturbed by these developments. He chuckled softly to himself, well aware of the monumental challenges these companies would face in attempting to catch up to the iPhone's success, let alone Kishin's ongoing developments in the Android ecosystem. His confidence stemmed from an in-depth understanding of the complexities and the innovative leaps his company had achieved. On the other hand, a few companies like Samstar and other lesser-known phone brands saw value in Kishin's proposal. Recognizing the opportunity to leverage Kishin's expertise and the potential of the Android platform, they agreed to collaborate. They viewed this partnership not as a compromise but as a strategic move, one that could help them enhance their technological capabilities and compete more effectively in the rapidly evolving mobile market. Dash. Meanwhile, the Kishin App Store, particularly its video game section, became a focal point for another strategic collaboration. Recognizing the revolutionary potential of the iPhone as a gaming platform, Kishin entered into partnerships with several video game studios. These collaborations were aimed at developing a range of iPhone-specific video games that users could easily download directly to their devices. Kishin successfully convinced these studios of the iPhone's unique value proposition. By leveraging the iPhone's advanced capabilities, these game developers had the opportunity to reimagine mobile gaming, creating experiences that were richer and more immersive than anything available on traditional mobile phones. Kishin outlined a model where developers could monetize their games either through direct sales in the App Store or by incorporating ads, offering them a new revenue stream. The studios were enthusiastic about the prospects. The iPhone's large, multi-touch screen, powerful processor, and sophisticated graphics capabilities opened up new possibilities for game design and interaction that were previously inconceivable on mobile devices. Developers could now create games that took full advantage of these features, offering users a gaming experience that rivaled handheld gaming consoles. Moreover, the global reach of the Kishin App Store meant that these games had the potential to be exposed to a vast audience, significantly increasing their visibility and potential for success. This was an enticing prospect for video game studios from well-established names looking to expand their digital footprint to smaller indie developers eager to break into the market. As they began to work on iPhone-specific titles, the excitement within these studios was palpable. The collaboration between Kishin and the game developers was seen as a pioneering move, one that could set new standards for mobile gaming. With the boundless possibilities offered by the iPhone, both Kishin and its partner studios were hopeful about the future, ready to explore uncharted territories in the gaming landscape. Chapter 473, Incredible Sales In the polished, high-ceilinged boardroom of Kishin, Chairman Shin sat at the head of the long, sleek table, surrounded by his key employees. 
The atmosphere was charged with anticipation as they gathered for the weekly board meeting, a few weeks following the iPhone's release. Shin, maintaining his composed demeanor, opened the meeting by presenting the iPhone sales report. As of now, he began, his voice steady and clear, the 4GB model has reached sales of 45,000 units, while the 8GB model has seen 32,000 units sold. In total, this has generated approximately 5 billion yen for Kishin. A murmur of approval swept through the room. The figures surpassed expectations, validating the hard work and innovation that had gone into the iPhone's development. The key employees, many of whom had been with Kishin through various product launches, exchanged satisfied glances, their expressions a blend of pride and relief. Li Han, the esteemed CEO of Kishin Rules and a pivotal figure in the company's strategy and operations, leaned forward with a modest smile. At the age of 62, he had witnessed the ascent of Kishin, experiencing firsthand its evolution from an ambitious startup to a technological powerhouse. Reflecting on the iPhone's success, he recognized not just the device's groundbreaking features but also the visionary leadership of Shin, the chairman and architect behind Kishin's journey from a humble 8 bit console to the innovative forefront of the tech industry. Their history stretched back to the days when Li Han was merely managing a small space in a local mall where Shin first set up an arcade. That encounter, pivotal and life-changing, led to Li Han joining Qishin, marking the start of a transformative journey. Breaking the contemplative silence, Li Han spoke up, this is a remarkable achievement. The iPhone sets us apart from the conventional phones cluttering the market. Its advanced capabilities could redefine user expectations, propelling our sales even further. Chairman Shin, absorbing Li Han's words, nodded in agreement. Their mutual respect was palpable, a bond strengthened over countless challenges and victories. Indeed, Li Han, Shin replied thoughtfully. The iPhone is not just a product, it's a trailblazer. While competitors scramble to catch up, they'll face the daunting task of matching its innovative operating system and user experience. He surveyed the room, his gaze settling on each team member. Your efforts have been exemplary. Continue to excel, and I assure you, your dedication will be rewarded handsomely. A gentle wave of laughter filled the room, easing the tension and cementing a collective resolve. The impressive iPhone sales figures were more than a corporate triumph, they were a clarion call to push boundaries, innovate relentlessly, and maintain Kishin's dominance in a rapidly evolving global marketplace. The meeting progressed, fueled by a shared vision and an unyielding drive to not only anticipate the future but to actively shape it. As the meeting drew to a close, there was a palpable sense of unity among the team. They were part of something groundbreaking and under Shin and Li Han's leadership, they were ready to face the challenges and opportunities that lay ahead. Dash. In the grandeur of Samaza Suzuki's mansion, the atmosphere was tinged with a blend of awe and concern. At 97 years old, Samaza, the patriarch of the Suzuki family, reflected on the monumental achievements of his youngest grandson's company, Kishin. Despite his age, his mind was as sharp as ever, his words flowing with clarity and insight. I can't believe how far my youngest grandson's company has come, redefining an entire industry with its groundbreaking phone, Samaza mused, a sense of pride unmistakable in his voice. Kumiko, his wife, was pacing the room, her brows furrowed in worry. But aren't you concerned? Your grandson's company is overshadowing the one you built. How can Suzuki ever develop something to compete with such an incredible phone? Her voice was laden with anxiety for the legacy her husband had established and the challenges their children now faced. Samaza let out a soft chuckle, his response tinged with wisdom and acceptance. Hehe, <laughs> don't worry too much, my dear. It's not our battle to fight anymore. It's time for our children to face these challenges. As for resistance, I doubt there's much they can do. The Suzuki phone department might indeed face a tough road ahead because of this Kishin phone. As he spoke, Samaza held an iPhone in his hands, maneuvering through its features with surprising ease. His acceptance of change and confidence in the face of industry shifts served as a stark contrast to Kumiko's concerns, highlighting a generational divide in their approaches to legacy and innovation. Dash. Suzuki, once among the companies that poked fun at Kishin through their commercials, now faced a challenging predicament in its phone sector. Their devices, which once held significant appeal in the market, were rapidly losing their luster. As sales plummeted, the company found itself grappling with decreasing revenue, mirroring the struggles faced by other phone manufacturers in the wake of the iPhone's success. In a bid to stay afloat and maintain some level of market presence, Suzuki and other companies were compelled to reduce the prices of their phones. 
This strategy aimed to stimulate sales by making their products more attractive to budget-conscious consumers. Although this meant that profit margins were considerably thinner, the alternative ceasing sales altogether was far worse. The goal was to keep the products moving, ensuring some cash flow, even if it was minimal. Besides price reductions, these phone manufacturers also embarked on aggressive marketing campaigns, attempting to highlight any unique features their phones might still possess in comparison to the iPhone. They focused on areas where they believed the iPhone could be perceived as lacking, such as battery life, durability, or even simplicity for less tech-savvy users. Additionally, some companies began to invest in research and development, albeit with constrained budgets, hoping to innovate or catch up in areas where they had fallen behind. They looked into developing their own operating systems, exploring alternative materials for construction, and enhancing user interfaces to provide a more seamless experience. Collaborations and partnerships became more common as these companies sought to pool their resources and knowledge. Some engaged in talks with new tech startups for fresh ideas, while others looked towards established tech giants for support and potential collaborations that could bring about the next big breakthrough in mobile technology. In these desperate times, customer service and user experience took on new importance. Companies revamped their service offerings, providing more extensive warranties, better support services, and more attractive after-sale benefits to retain their customer base. As the mobile phone landscape continued to evolve rapidly, these measures represented the phone manufacturer's attempts to adapt and survive. The emergence of the iPhone had irrevocably changed the market, forcing traditional phone brands to reconsider every aspect of their business models and strategies. Chapter 474, Additional Revenue Apple, which collaborated with Keishin in developing the operating system for the iPhone, found itself on the receiving end of numerous proposals from other phone brands seeking to develop their own operating systems. However, Apple's response was generally discouraging. They warned that creating a new operating system from scratch would be a daunting, time-consuming task, one that could take years of development without infringing on Keishin's iPhone operating system patents. Moreover, Apple emphasized the dynamic nature of the tech industry, pointing out that by the time these companies managed to develop their own systems, the Keishin iPhone would already have solidified its lead in the market. Steve Jobs, aware of the technological leaps being made, understood the futility in other brands attempting to catch up under these circumstances. Jobs was also privy to Keishin's broader strategic moves, including the development of another operating system, known as the Android OS. This system was being crafted specifically for use by other phone brands, a move that would further cement Keishin's dominance in the market. The Android OS was anticipated to be well-developed and available before other companies could even finalize their own, likely rendering any competing systems inferior in comparison. Compounding the dilemma for these other phone brands was the fact that Keishin held a significant stake in Apple, effectively controlling a major portion of the company's decision-making processes. This influence meant that Apple was not in a position to assist Keishin's competitors in any meaningful way, further tightening Keishin's grip on the market. Confronted with this reality, CEOs of other phone brands could do little but shake their heads in resignation. The partnership between Apple and Keishin, combined with Keishin's strategic foresight and innovative developments like the Android OS, left little room for competitors to maneuver. They were faced with the stark realization that the landscape of the mobile industry had changed irrevocably, with Keishin leading the charge into new technological frontiers. As the iPhone continued to captivate the market, rival phone brands watched with a mix of awe and envy particularly regarding the innovative concept that was turning into a significant revenue stream for Keishin, the Keishin App Store. This platform extended beyond the iTunes service, which already generated substantial income through music downloads. The Keishin App Store revolutionized how applications, especially video games, were distributed and monetized on mobile devices. Other companies could not ignore the dual revenue model presented by the App Store. On one hand, there were premium apps and games requiring upfront payment, directly contributing to Keishin's revenues. On the other hand, the store offered free games, which were not without their profit-making potential. Keishin had cleverly introduced a model where these free applications could host advertisements, opening yet another lucrative revenue channel. The proposal Keishin made to these brands regarding advertising within apps introduced a new dimension to mobile marketing. As a result, free video games on the app store began to receive numerous offers to include advertisements, turning even no-cost applications into sources of income. Despite the iPhone currently being available only in Japan, the sheer number of users amounting to thousands upon thousands coupled with their considerable buying power, presented a highly attractive proposition for brands looking to advertise. The Japanese market was renowned for its consumer strength, 
and the introduction of the iPhone and its accompanying App Store created new, untapped avenues for advertisers aiming to reach this valuable demographic. This shift illustrated the broadening scope of mobile technology's influence on consumer habits and marketing strategies. Other phone brands, left out of this burgeoning ecosystem, could only observe Keishin's growing success and strategize on how to respond to this new era of mobile engagement and commerce. The Keishin App Store had not just changed the game for app distribution, it had reshaped the landscape of digital advertising and consumer interaction, setting a high benchmark for the industry. Dash. Shinichi and his friends were engrossed in a session of Temple Run on their iPhones when Shinichi suddenly blurted out, Damn, I started to realize that a few days ago, we are receiving few ads every half hour when playing Temple Run. Ryo, looking up from his screen, replied nonchalantly, Yeah, but I don't really mind. Maybe this is how the game developers earn from the fact that Temple Run is a free video game. Satoshi chimed in with a nod, You're right. How else could these game developers earn money by making their game free? Right. Takeshi nodded in agreement, silently acknowledging the necessity of ads in free games. Arnold, who had been quietly listening to their discussion, added, Besides, because of these advertisements appearing, I now know earlier of the latest car model of Kishin. The Omega Zero One car model. I wanted to have it so badly. It looks amazing. But I'm still in elementary, no way I can buy it. Ryo nodded in agreement, right. My mom also likes the ads, because she can see that some advertisements have fashion brands' latest offerings. She said that if not for the ads, she would be late to the latest trends, and will be much late to know it with her circle of friends that is a fashion freaks. The group burst into laughter at Ryo's words, finding humor in the idea of staying up to date through game ads. Amidst the laughter, Shinichi couldn't help but smile wryly, observing his friends seemingly having no problem with the ads. Reflecting on it, Shinichi realized that, Compared to video games that can cost thousands of yen, the appearance of ads doesn't seem as bad as he initially thought. Chapter 475, Big Game Production Before the iPhone made its debut in the US market, there was a palpable sense of anticipation in the busy Kishin studio. Actors dressed in motion capture suits were immersed in their roles, delivering lines for American's Dream, a game project spearheaded by Kishin. Unknown to them, they were contributing to what would soon be unveiled as part of the iconic Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas Saga. The actors were thrilled about their involvement, knowing they were contributing to a video game project under the banner of Kishin, a leading powerhouse in the gaming industry. The cast and crew of American's Dream were currently just focusing on their work, driven by the generous salaries provided by Kishin. In the vibrant heart of Kishin Studio, Christopher Bellard fully embodies the main character of the American's Dream project. Immersed in the role of CJ, he strides confidently across the set, engaging seamlessly with fellow actors donned in motion capture suits. As he locks eyes with the actor portraying Sweet, the scene begun. CJ's voice cuts through the air with urgency, Hey, Sweet. Sweet, attired similarly, responds with a casual, Was up. It's time for smoke, CJ declares with resolve. All right, let's roll, Sweet agrees embodying the loyalty and readiness that defines his character. The two, now the Johnson brothers, articulate their mission with conviction, Johnson brothers fit in to take that fat fool down. In the studio, a prop car mimics the gritty streets of East Los Santos, the illusion of movement created by the cleverly designed set. You sure he's in East Los Santos? CJ inquires, as they pretend to navigate the city's treacherous roads. Yet, yeah, right above the edge of Los Flores, some old apartments and a warehouse, Sweet confirms, the backdrop lending authenticity to their simulated journey. As they approach their imagined destination, the air thick with tension, CJ critiques the vehicle choice, adding a touch of levity, he as good as dead then. Can't believe you bought that same bucket ass car, man. Sweet's reply is pragmatic, tinged with humor, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Their banter continues until they reach the climactic moment of their confrontation. So this is it hey? Johnson boy sorting this stuff out. Nervous. Sweet probes, their characters now at the precipice of their virtual ordeal. Yet. CJ admits, the weight of their fictional undertaking palpable. Me too, me too, Sweet concedes, sharing in the gravity of the moment. Still inside the studio environment, the tension escalates as they arrive supposedly outside the crack den, the prop car coming to a standstill. Sweet, embodying the moment pulls out his Desert Eagle, the sense of impending action heightening. 
CJ's response is swift, lowering Sweet's gun with a firm hand, Look, I know you down for this, but I gotta go in there alone. The scene played out under the watchful eyes of the cameras capturing every moment for the game's production and behind-the-scenes footage. As the game's production neared completion, the actors remained engrossed in their roles, oblivious to the true nature of the project they were part of. They were unaware that their performances were contributing to the next installment in the Grand Theft Auto series, a franchise notorious for its depiction of violence and the controversies it often sparked in the media. After completing the scene, the cast members gathered, exchanging thoughts and impressions. Christopher initiated the conversation, I'm really curious about how Americans' dream will turn out in KS2. Laughing, another actor chimed in, Man, I'm actually eager to play it myself. Imagine seeing your own character in the game that would be incredible. Hehe, <laughs> I feel the same way, Christopher replied with a grin. He then turned thoughtful, based on the scenes we've done, it seems like the game might have a pretty intense theme, hey? Huh? It feels like we're delving into the grittier, more tumultuous side of American life. The actor portraying Big Smoke weighed in, true, we kind of expected that from the beginning. But it's ironic, isn't it? The title American's Dream hardly sounds like it matches the violent undertones. Christopher laughed, then quipped, yeah, it's like calling a horror movie Sweet Dreams misleading, but definitely grabs your attention. After taking a break, the cast and crew resumed their recording, diving back into their roles for the end of the line saga. This signaled that they were nearing the completion of the American's Dream game project, a milestone that meant the end of shooting wasn't far off. Soon, the cast would discover that they were part of the popular Grand Theft Auto series, a flagship title for Kishin. However, due to confidential reasons, Kishin had kept the true nature of the project under wraps until the game was officially ready to be released. The revelation would come as a surprise, altering their perception of the work they had been contributing to in the context of their performances, transforming their understanding of the characters they portrayed and the narrative they helped to bring the game to authenticity. Chapter 476, Resident Evil 4 As the production for GDASA was approaching completion, another one of Kishin's video games, Resident Evil 4, made waves in the market with the release of its trailers and teasers in both the USA and Japan. In the USA, the Resident Evil 4 trailers were met with immense excitement. Fans were captivated by the stunning visuals and the promise of a new, more intense survival horror experience. The American audience appreciated the game's shift towards a more action-oriented gameplay while maintaining its horror roots, sparking discussions and high expectations on social media and gaming forums. Meanwhile, in Japan, the teasers ignited a fervent anticipation among the series' loyal fanbase. The Japanese trailers emphasized the game's eerie atmosphere resonating deeply with the cultural fascination for horror stories. Fans praised the game's enhanced graphics and were particularly intrigued by the mysterious new settings and enemies showcased. Despite all the buzz surrounding the Kishin iPhone, which has been making waves for a while, I remain a dedicated gamer at heart. I've been itching to dive into some horror games. Exclaimed a gamer from the USA, unable to contain his enthusiasm. The iPhone 1, having recently launched in Japan, has yet to make its debut in the USA. However, it has already generated significant buzz and anticipation, not just stateside, but globally. Nevertheless, there are gamers who haven't been caught up in the hype, preferring to stick to what they love best, Kishin video games. Despite the recent release of Silent Hill 3 for both console and PC, many console gamers are yearning for new Kishin titles. They express frustration over Kishin's expanding diversity feeling that the company's foray into the phone, aerospace and automotive industries has shifted its focus away from what they believe Kishin does best, video games and console development. These gamers find themselves nostalgic for a time when Kishin was solely devoted to the gaming world, longing for the days before the company expanded into other sectors. In October 2002, Resident Evil 4 was finally released in both the Japanese and American markets. Loyal fans of the KS2 console eagerly scooped up their copies, diving into the long-awaited horror experience. Kyle, an avid gamer, had just purchased his copy of Resident Evil 4 and was about to play it for the first time. Settling into his favorite gaming chair, he switched off the lights to set the mood, the glow of the TV casting eerie shadows around his room. With the game disc inserted, he grabbed his controller, his anticipation palpable. As the game loaded, Kyle's eyes were glued to the screen, absorbing every detail of the haunting intro. All right. Let's see if you're as scary as I am expecting you to be, he muttered to himself, a mix of excitement and apprehension in his voice. Hours passed, 
with Kyle navigating through the game's creepy locales, jumping at sudden noises and growling in frustration at tough enemies. His reactions ranged from tense silence during exploration to exclaims of no way. And get off me. During intense battles. The immersive atmosphere of the game had him on the edge of his seat, his focus unwavering. At one particularly suspenseful moment, as his character was ambushed by a horde of zombies, Kyle leaned forward, his fingers working furiously on the controller. Come on, come on. He whispered urgently, dodging attacks and firing back in the game. When he finally cleared the area, he let out a long, relieved sigh, sinking back into his chair. This is insane, he said with a shaky laugh, both exhilarated and exhausted. The TV screen flickered with the eerie, desolate scenes of the game, perfectly echoing Kyle's roller coaster of emotions. Best horror game ever, he declared to the empty room, a satisfied grin spreading across his face despite the lingering adrenaline. He was hooked, already looking forward to the next terrifying challenge Resident Evil 4 would throw at him. Besides Kyle, the majority of gamers who purchased Resident Evil 4 shared similar sentiments. However, after playing the game for a few hours, their opinions began to diversify, reflecting a broad range of experiences and impressions. A day after the game's release, forums were abuzz with discussions about Resident Evil 4. Players from different backgrounds and levels of gaming expertise shared their first impressions, highlighting various aspects of their initial gameplay experience. Some gamers were particularly impressed by the opening scene in the eerie European village, where the sense of isolation and danger set the tone for the rest of the game. The moment you step into that village and everything just goes south, it's unforgettable, one gamer wrote, reflecting the tension and surprise that many felt. Others pointed to the intense, heart-pounding encounter with the chainsaw-wielding enemy as a standout moment. When that guy with the chainsaw appeared, I literally screamed, another admitted, highlighting the game's ability to deliver genuine scares. There were also players who appreciated the game's departure from the traditional fixed camera angles of previous titles, praising the new over-the-shoulder perspective for adding depth to the gameplay. The new camera angle changes everything. It feels like you're really there, which makes it so much scarier, a gamer commented. Chapter 477, Horror Theme Parks Four days after its release, Resident Evil 4 had already sold around 248,000 units in Japan and the USA combined. With an estimated release price of $50 per unit, the overall sales reached approximately $12,400,000. The game's success continued to grow as word of mouth spread, bolstering sales even further. Additionally, the release of Resident Evil 4 reignited discussions and controversies surrounding the series, particularly theories regarding the virus that had been a central theme since before the 1990s. This renewed interest helped to maintain the game's prominence in the public eye and fueled ongoing debates and speculations among fans. At the same time, Kishin was well aware of the market potential behind the controversies and theories surrounding the Resident Evil series, such as those involving the Umbrella Corporation and the T-Virus. Consequently, Kishin had been developing Resident Evil-themed attractions within Kishin World theme parks for quite some time, anticipating the resurgence of interest that would accompany the release of Resident Evil 4. With the game's launch reigniting the series' controversy and fan theories, Kishin World theme parks in the USA and Japan unveiled their Resident Evil-themed sections. Capitalizing on the renewed popularity of the series, these theme parks were promptly advertised, drawing fans who were eager to immerse themselves in the spine-tingling world of Resident Evil. As a result, visitors flocked to the horror-themed parks, seeking the thrill of being scared in settings reminiscent of the game's chilling environments. This strategic move by Kishin not only enhanced the theme park's appeal but also deepened fans' engagement with the Resident Evil franchise. Dash. In the wake of Resident Evil 4's release, Kishin World's new attraction, the Resident Evil Experience, was drawing crowds by the thousands. Underneath a sky smeared with twilight hues, fans of the series and casual visitors alike queued, buzzing with anticipation and clad in merchandise that paid homage to the iconic horror saga. Jenny, a die-hard fan of the series, and her friend Mark, more a casual observer, stepped into the dimly lit entrance of the themed zone. The sound of distant groans and the subtle scent of artificial decay set a chilling atmosphere. Wow, they really didn't hold back on the details, Mark commented, eyeing the meticulously recreated Raccoon City Police Department facade. Jenny, with wide eyes full of excitement, clutched her Resident Evil-themed bag tighter. I heard they have actors dressed as zombies and even a chainsaw guy roaming around. Can't wait to see that. No sooner had she spoken than a horde of zombies staggered into view, their makeup gruesomely realistic. 
A shriek escaped Jenny's lips, more from delight than fear, as she pulled Mark's arm, look. They're coming this way. The actors, fully committed to their roles, advanced with haunting moans, causing the pair and surrounding visitors to laugh nervously and beg away. The atmosphere was electric, a perfect blend of fear, fun, and adrenaline. Suddenly, the unmistakable roar of a chainsaw sliced through the cacophony of screams and ambient sounds. From around a corner lumbered a towering figure, wielding a revving chainsaw, his mask a grotesque caricature of terror. The crowd's nervous laughter turned into genuine squeals of fright as they scattered, the chainsaw zombie in hot pursuit. This is amazing! Jenny exclaimed, half laughing, half screaming as they ran. The thrill of the chase, the joy of shared fear among strangers it was a unique bonding experience. After escaping their pursuers, they explored further. The park was a labyrinth of horrors and delights, a replica of the Spencer Mansion, complete with puzzle locks and secret passages, a safe room cafe where visitors could catch their breath over themed snacks and drinks, and an interactive shooting range where guests could test their skills against approaching zombie hordes. As they queued for the escape room experience, Jenny chatted excitedly with fellow fans, exchanging theories and favorite game moments. Mark, though less familiar with the lore, found himself drawn into the conversations, captivated by the depth of the world and its characters. Inside the escape room, teamwork and screams filled the air as they solved puzzles under the pressure of a ticking clock and the intermittent appearance of zombies through hidden doors. The sense of achievement when they finally broke free was palpable. Exiting the attraction, faces flushed with excitement and fear, Jenny and Mark shared a look of exhilarated satisfaction. That was incredible, Mark admitted, a newfound respect for the series sparking within him. Jenny's eyes sparkled with vindication. Hehe, <laughs> told you it will be quite exciting. As night deepened, they left the theme park with memories that would be memorable for a lifetime, the echoes of zombies and the roar of the chainsaw edged into their exhilarating night. The Resident Evil series, a jewel in the crown of Kishin's gaming empire, had not only captivated gamers worldwide but had also become a cornerstone of Kishin World's burgeoning theme park's business. The series' successful integration into the theme park landscape, particularly with the immersive Resident Evil experience, showcased Kishin's prowess in creating compelling, cross-platform entertainment experiences. Kishin World was steadily climbing the ranks, inching closer to the status of the number one theme park destination, rivaling even the beloved and iconic Walt Disney Parks. The culinary offerings within Kishin World, themed around various Kishin franchises and providing immersive dining experiences, were starting to compete with the diverse and celebrated restaurants found within Disney properties. Amid this burgeoning success, Kishin was not content to rest on its laurels. Observers noticed a strategic move unfolding, Kishin had been quietly acquiring stocks in Walt Disney. This wasn't a mere diversification of investments, insiders suggested that Kishin harbored grander ambitions. Whispers turned into loud chatter as rumors circulated that Kishin was considering a bold move aiming for a full acquisition of the Walt Disney Company. This development stirred the pot in both the entertainment and business worlds. Analysts speculated on the implications such a takeover would have on the landscape of global entertainment. Would Kishin, with its roots deeply embedded in gaming and technological innovation, bring a new era to the storied legacy of Walt Disney's enchanting kingdoms? Only time would reveal Kishin's true intentions and the potential transformations this ambitious endeavor could bring to the beloved world of theme parks and beyond. Chapter 478, Disney's Worries Besides the adrenaline-inducing Resident Evil-themed sections, Kishin World also boasted more family-friendly attractions. Initially, these areas were dominated by Kishin's family-friendly video games, which appealed particularly to younger audiences and gamers. These interactive zones, filled with colorful landscapes and beloved characters from Kishin's popular titles, offered a delightful escape for families and younger visitors, blending the excitement of video games with the tangible joy of theme park adventures. Following this gaming-centric approach, the theme park expanded its appeal to animation enthusiasts with the addition of areas dedicated to famous animated films. This new venture was largely due to Kishin's strategic acquisition of Pixar Animation Studios two years prior, a move that had sent waves through the entertainment industry. By integrating beloved Pixar stories and characters into the park, Kishin World bridged the gap between digital animation and real-world experiences, offering immersive attractions based on early hits like Toy Story, A Bug's Life, and Monsters, Inc. These Pixar-themed sections offered a stark contrast to the intense atmosphere of the Resident Evil areas, providing a delightful and enchanting experience for younger visitors and families. The addition of these areas demonstrated Kishin's ability to cater to a wide range of tastes and age groups, 
enhancing the park's reputation as a diverse entertainment destination. Dash. Inside the sleek, modern boardroom of the Walt Disney headquarters, the atmosphere was charged with a palpable tension. Executives, clad in sharp suits and polished shoes, gathered around the polished mahogany table, each one displaying varying degrees of concern and contemplation. At the head of the table sat the CEO, Mark Wilkins, his expression composed yet revealing an underlying sense of urgency. Everyone, as you know, Mark started, maintaining a calm tone, Kishin has snapped up a 38% stake in our company. That's a substantial chunk. We need to grasp the full impact of this development and plan our next steps wisely. He paused, allowing his words to sink in, as murmurs and nods passed through the group. The question we need to address, continued a senior executive, leaning forward, is whether Kishin is positioning itself as a collaborator, or if they're gearing up for a complete takeover. Their diversification has been aggressive theme parks, video games, now this. Another executive chimed in, their success with the Resident Evil attractions and the integration of Pixar has put them on a new level in terms of theme park experiences. It's innovative, it's drawing crowds. We can't ignore the impact this could have on our own parks and attractions. Mark nodded thoughtfully. Let's think about how we can turn this to our advantage. Having Kishin as a significant shareholder could open the door to their technology and creativity. This presents an opportunity for collaboration that could really boost our parks and experiences. But, we need to be careful to maintain our own corporate independence. A younger executive, tapping on her tablet, added, there's also public perception to consider. If the market sees Kishin as rescuing or significantly influencing Disney, it could shift the power dynamic in the eyes of our customers and stakeholders. Mark Wilkins leaned back, taking in everyone's input. We need a layered approach, he said thoughtfully. Let's look for ways to sign Ridge Eyes with Kishin, particularly where their tech can amplify what we offer. But it's just as crucial to underscore what makes Disney unique our values, the sense of nostalgia we evoke, the unparalleled connection we have with families worldwide. We must remind people why Disney has been a beloved part of their lives for so long. Standing up, Mark ended the meeting with a decisive tone, his gaze meeting each executive in turn. Let's proceed with a mix of detailed analysis and strategic foresight. And remember, while Kishin might be in a position to increase their stake, we hold significant power too. I urge you not to sell your shares to them. Our strength lies in our unity and shared vision. The executives nodded, their expressions a mix of resolve and understanding. They recognized the stakes both figuratively and literally. Their individual decisions regarding their shares could shape the company's future and their roles within it. The message was clear. Their loyalty to Disney was not just about job security but about preserving the magic and influence of a global icon. The higher UPS at Walt Disney were understandably perturbed by Kishin's clear intentions to acquire the company, signaling a potentially significant shift in the entertainment landscape. Amid these corporate undercurrents, Kishin made another strategic move by launching the highly anticipated iPhone in the US market at the end of October. This release was set to amplify Kishin's influence not only within the United States but also on a global scale. The introduction of the iPhone, a device anticipated to revolutionize the tech industry, underscored Kishin's growing dominance and innovative prowess, further impacting their standing and power dynamics in the competitive markets. As the iPhone was officially announced for release, distributors such as Kishin, Walmart, and other major retailers began stocking their shelves with the highly anticipated device. The build-up of anticipation had been meticulously cultivated, leading to throngs of eager customers lining up outside stores. The moment the sales began, people flooded in, determined to get their hands on the new iPhone. Lines snaked around Apple and Kishin stores, and malls buzzed with activity, especially around the Kishin sections, as people clamored to purchase their own iPhone. This frenzy was a clear indicator of the iPhone's magnetic appeal and Kishin's robust, well-established brand presence in the market. The excitement and urgency that permeated the air underscored the public's craze for the latest tech innovation and demonstrated Kishin's formidable influence in the tech and consumer worlds. Chapter 479, Incredible Revenue As the chilly October dawn broke over downtown, the line outside the Kishin store already wrapped around the block. In the midst of the eager crowd, friends Jason and Carla stood wrapped in their warm jackets, their breath misting in the cold air as they waited for their chance to grab an iPhone. Can you believe it's finally here? Carla said, her voice bubbling with excitement as she turned to Jason. The day we've been counting down to. You must be thrilled, Jason. Jason offered an enthusiastic nod, 
his attention momentarily breaking away from the steadily advancing line. Of course, he agreed. I haven't stopped tracking the updates since they first announced it. Kishin is really changing the game with this one. Just ahead, a local news reporter was chatting with a young woman at the very front of the line. So, what makes you so eager to get the new iPhone? He inquired, holding out his microphone to her. Do you really need to ask? She replied, her eyes sparkling with excitement. Just look at the phones we have now they're all about tiny screens and keypads. But the iPhone? It's a game changer with its big, wide touch screen and features that blow every other phone out of the water. She couldn't hide her enthusiasm. It's going to revolutionize the way we connect with each other, the way we work basically, it's going to change everything. As the Kishin store doors swung open, the crowd erupted in cheers. The anticipation that had built up in the line now turned into a shared wave of excitement as everyone moved forward. Inside, the store was buzzing with energy, Kishin employees were everywhere, guiding customers and highlighting the features of the sleek, new iPhones. Hold on, here it is. Jason exclaimed, the moment he had the boxed iPhone in his grasp. His eyes lit up with disbelief. I can hardly believe it's real. Carla leaned in closer, her gaze fixed on the box in Jason's hands. It's stunning, she whispered, her voice filled with wonder. Just look at that screen. It's all screen. They weren't alone in their amazement, around them, others were experiencing the same joyous shock, carefully examining their new phones, their faces reflecting the glow of the innovative screens. Stepping out of the store, their precious new iPhones secure, Jason looked at his device with a sense of reverence. This isn't just a phone, it's a piece of history. I'm going to keep this forever. Carla, holding her own box protectively, smiled in agreement. Absolutely, this is one for the books. When the iPhone burst onto the scene, sales for other cell phone brands plummeted, a trend that wasn't entirely surprising given the massive impact of the iPhone's earlier launch in Japan. In response, these companies started crafting strategies to soften the blow of the iPhone's arrival in the US. Realizing the draw of the iPhone's cutting-edge features, these brands came to terms with the fact that their traditional models with keypads and smaller screens were losing their appeal, especially when some of their higher-end models were even pricier than the iPhone. Cutting prices was their first knee-jerk reaction, but they knew this alone wouldn't cut it. First off, they stopped producing their priciest models that weren't selling, cutting their losses and redirecting those funds from production into research and development. They were determined to bridge the tech divide between their devices and the iPhone's sophisticated offerings. Next, they doubled down on their marketing, showcasing the reliability, durability, and unique features of their phone's qualities the iPhone didn't have. They zeroed in on specific customer segments that still valued features like physical keyboards or rugged outdoor performance. They also rolled out trade-in offers, tempting customers with significant discounts to swap out their old phones. They aimed to attract those watching their budgets or those who were maybe a bit skeptical about jumping on the touchscreen bandwagon. Despite these efforts, the tide was overwhelmingly in favor of the iPhone. The allure of Kishin's latest innovation seemed unstoppable, resonating with American consumers' buying power and preferences. The competing brand's efforts were overshadowed as the iPhone continued its ascendancy, possibly becoming the new symbol of mobile communication and technology in the world. Dash. Following the iPhone's triumph in both Japan and the USA, Kishin's net worth and revenue soared to unprecedented heights. In the USA, where the iPhone was priced higher than in Japan, the 4GB model was tagged at $599 and the 8GB at $699. This pricing strategy paid off handsomely, with Kishin's opening sales in the USA hitting around $54.7 million. In Japan, where the iPhone had been available for a month or so, the sales figures were even more impressive, totaling approximately $160.168 million USD. Combined, the initial sales from these two major markets brought Kishin's coffers a staggering sum of about $214 million. This financial windfall highlighted not only the iPhone's global appeal but also solidified Kishin's position as a dominant force in the technology sector, setting the stage for further expansion and innovation. The cell phone brands that had previously mocked Kishin in their commercials found themselves in a starkly different position as the estimated sales reports of the iPhone reached them. Gone were the days of light-hearted jabs and confident boasts, now, they could only watch in silence, digesting the numbers that underscored the iPhone's overwhelming success. Chapter 480, Video Game Mods The World of Warcraft PC Merpage by Kishin has captured the hearts of players across Asia, the USA, and Europe.
maintaining immense popularity since its release. This success story is part of a broader trend where PC video games have enjoyed sustained appeal over the years. Within this landscape, an underrated community that has been quietly growing in prominence is that of gamers who love to mod video games. This community has breathed new life into various PC games, transforming even some of the less successful titles from other studios into popular hits through modding. These modifications can range from simple tweaks to complete overhauls, demonstrating the creativity and ingenuity of the modders. The appeal of modding lies in the ability to reimagine, customize, and enhance the gaming experience, making it uniquely personal and often more engaging. The rise in popularity of modded games reflects a growing appreciation for the creativity involved in game modding. This movement has not only kept older or less successful games alive but has also established modding as a popular hobby among those who enjoy delving into and redefining the mechanics and aesthetics of their favorite video games. In the spacious, meticulously organized office atop the Qishin Rules Building, Chairman Shin sat behind his expansive desk, his eyes scanning through lists of PC games that had been transformed by the creative endeavors of modders. He was particularly interested in finding a mod akin to the concept of Dota, a gem from his previous life that had revolutionized PC gaming by creating an entirely new genre. For quite a while now, Shin had harbored the hope that a gamer would take the initiative to craft a mod resembling Dota, infusing new life into the gaming world and carving out a fresh niche in the PC gaming landscape. However, despite his extensive search, no such mod had emerged. As the realization settled in, a spark of inspiration ignited within him. Why wait for someone else to make the first move? With a sudden surge of motivation, Shin contemplated the possibility of taking matters into his own hands. He envisioned modding one of his company's most successful games, Warcraft series, transforming it into a Dota-like experience. Determined, Shin began outlining his vision for the mod, already brainstorming the mechanics, characters, and map design that would pay homage to the original Dota while bringing something new to the players. He decided he would release this mod under the pseudonym Invoker69. Shin could easily have his company develop a game identical to Dota, but such a move felt unexciting and uninspired to him. Throughout his tenure, Shin had reintroduced successful video games from his previous life into this world, watching them flourish anew. However, he yearned for this world's video game industry to burgeon with its own unique creativity and originality something he could truly relish and take pride in as a part of this reality. Recognizing the untapped potential within the modding community, Shin saw an opportunity not just to introduce a game but to cultivate a movement. He envisioned leveraging the mod he planned to create from World of Warcraft a project that would echo Dota in spirit but would serve as a canvas for this world's creativity. By integrating Dota's core concepts into the Warcraft framework through modding, Shin aimed to ignite a spark within the modding community. He hoped this initiative would not only foster a new genre in this reality but also encourage modders to innovate, adapt, and expand upon the original idea, thereby contributing to the evolution of the gaming landscape here. His plan was to inspire the community by example, demonstrating the vast possibilities modding could unlock. If his Dota mod gained traction, it could set a precedent, encouraging gamers and modders alike to explore, innovate, and create unique content that reflects their own world's creativity and vision. Shin recognized the remarkable talent within the modding community of this world, having observed their ability to transform lesser-known or unsuccessful games into popular hits through their creative modifications. It was this potential that Shin hoped to tap into and amplify with the inspiration of Dota. By introducing a Dota mod for Warcraft, Shin aimed to demonstrate the possibilities that lay in remagining existing games, encouraging modders to see beyond the limitations of the original gameplay and envision what could be. With determination, Shin started laying the groundwork for his ambitious project, modding Warcraft into a Dota experience. He knew such a colossal endeavor was beyond the scope of a solitary effort. Thus, adopting the guise of Invoker 69, Shin turned to the websites of modding forums and online communities, a place where like-minded creators converged. His mission was clear, to forge connections and spark collaborations with fellow modders. He had interacted with modders in his past life before becoming a game developer and he knew firsthand the innovative potential these individuals held. Now, despite finding the modding community in this new world still in its nascent stages, he could sense the undercurrent of raw, untapped potential brilliant minds brimming with fresh and intriguing ideas. Shin extended an open invitation for collaboration, sharing his vision and inviting input, critiques, and contributions. As Shin engaged with the handful of modders he encountered online, he found himself genuinely surprised and impressed by their ideas and the creativity they brought to the table. This unexpected depth of insight and innovation invigorated Shin, reinforcing his belief in the potential of this collaborative venture. 
Chapter 481, Hakajojima In November 2002, Hakajojima, a picturesque island nestled in the Philippine Sea, became the newest addition to Kishin's ambitious ventures. After setting its sights on this serene locale back in December 1999, Kishin has finally sealed the deal for an undisclosed sum believed to run into billions of yen. This acquisition marks the culmination of years of meticulous planning, challenging negotiations and overcoming numerous hurdles, including regulatory hoops, environmental considerations and some pushback from the public. Kishin's vision for Hakajojima is both clear and bold. The plan? To transform this tranquil island into a cutting-edge Kishin aerospace facility. The blueprint includes constructing launch pads, research centers, and residential areas for staff infrastructure that Kishin believes will not only elevate its own status but also bring a new era of technological advancement to the area. The sheer scale of the investment underscores Kishin's deep commitment and firm belief in the island's untapped potential. However, not everyone saw Kishin's project in a favorable light. The initiative sparked a mild controversy, fueled by media coverage. The acquisition of the island made headlines, igniting debates and attracting a swarm of journalists. Among them, Kishin's high-ranking executive, Mr. Fujimoto, found himself encircled by eager reporters, cameras poised and microphones extended. Mr. Fujimoto, how do you address the concerns of those against Kishin's development of Hakajojima for aerospace purposes? A reporter inquired, her voice piercing the brisk air. Fujimoto, no stranger to the spotlight, remained unflustered. We understand the concerns, he replied, his tone both calm and assured. However, we're committed to harmonizing Kishin's technological progress with environmental sustainability. Our vision extends beyond just establishing aerospace infrastructure, it encompasses community enhancement and ecological conservation efforts. His response echoed the sentiments prescribed by Kishin's chairman, yet it wasn't just a rehearsed spiel, Kishin genuinely aimed to balance its aerospace ambitions with the environmental well-being of Hakajojima. But what about the locals who had to be relocated? Another journalist interjected, aiming for a more personal line of inquiry. Fujimoto met the question with a level gaze, his voice infused with genuine concern. We've made certain that the relocation process was carried out with the utmost respect and fairness, he assured. Furthermore, we're channeling investments into enhancing local infrastructure and education systems, with the goal of enriching opportunities for the island's inhabitants. As the media barrage continued, Fujimoto adeptly navigated the flurry of inquiries, blending professionalism with heartfelt sincerity. He depicted a future where Kishin Aerospace not only pioneers in technological innovation but also plays a pivotal role in fostering community growth and upholding environmental integrity. As Kishin navigated through the public's concerns, the company was eager to kickstart its ambitious plans for Hakajojima. With the controversy gradually settling, the focus shifted towards the future, towards transforming the island into a cornerstone of aerospace innovation. Located under the jurisdiction of Tokyo, Hakajojima presented unique advantages for Kishin's aerospace division. Being part of the bustling metropolis's administrative reach meant that the island could benefit from the capital's robust logistical and infrastructural networks. This proximity to Tokyo provided Kishin with unparalleled access to a wealth of resources, including skilled labor, technological expertise and a sophisticated supply chain network essential for the construction and operation of the Kishin aerospace facilities. Furthermore, the island's strategic location offered significant logistical benefits for space operations. Situated in the Pacific, Hakajojima provided clear, unobstructed trajectories for satellite launches, crucial for establishing a reliable and efficient launch schedule. The maritime routes surrounding the island also facilitated the transport of heavy equipment and materials, streamlining the construction process and subsequent operational logistics. As construction officially commenced in late November 2002, Kishin set forth on a bold journey to transform Hakajojima into a pioneering aerospace hub. Given the scale and ambition of the project, including the establishment of launch pads, research facilities, and employee housing, the estimated time for completion was not trivial. Considering the complexities involved in building cutting-edge aerospace facilities, coupled with the need to ensure environmental protections and adhere to regulatory standards, the entire project was anticipated to span several phases. The initial groundwork and infrastructure development, including site preparation, utility setup, and basic facilities, could take up to two to three years. Following this, the construction of specialized aerospace structures, such as the launch pads and control centers, along with advanced research labs, would likely require an additional three to four years, given the high standards of safety, technology, and precision required. In total, 
Kishin projected that the ambitious plan to transform Hakajojima into a fully operational Kishin Aerospace Center could take anywhere from five to seven years. This timeline accounted for potential unforeseen challenges and the meticulous approach needed to ensure that the space operations met both national and international standards. While the construction of the Kishin Aerospace Center on Hakajojima is expected to span several years, Kishin could kickstart certain operations within just a few months of breaking ground. The first wave of construction focused on swiftly establishing crucial infrastructure, notably the launch pads the core of Kishin's aerospace ambitions. Through diligent planning and continuous hard work, these essential elements were fast-tracked, aligning with Kishin's rigorous safety and efficiency standards for upcoming satellite launches. Simultaneously, Kishin aimed to set up temporary but sturdy facilities to house vital staff and machinery. Although these were not designed as permanent solutions, they were crafted to be both effective and functional, ensuring the team could work efficiently right from the start. Safety was always at the forefront for Kishin, as they meticulously worked through the intricate maze of regulatory standards, upholding the precision and care they're known for. Their ongoing communication with aerospace regulators aimed to secure all necessary permits, ensuring their operations were in strict compliance with top-tier international norms. With these proactive measures in place, Kishin aimed to initiate test satellite launches within just a few months of starting construction a goal that, while ambitious, remained firmly within the realm of possibility given their detailed planning and forward-thinking approach. Chapter 482, Satellite Networks Following the iPhone's surge in popularity in Japan, the pre-existing 3G network, initially launched by NTT Docomo in 1998, came into the spotlight for its significant role in enhancing mobile internet experiences. The iPhone, leveraging this established 3G infrastructure, offered speeds that were revolutionary compared to the dial-up internet access common on keypad-based mobile phones of the time. The 3G technology, known for its faster data transmission, allowed iPhone users in Japan to enjoy broadband-like speeds directly on their devices. This was a game-changer in 2002, a time when mobile internet was synonymous with slow, clunky access. The iPhone users could browse the web, stream video content, and download files at unprecedented speeds, transforming the mobile phone from a simple communication tool into a powerful gateway to the internet. Not only in Japan, but also in the USA, the advent of 3G networks marked a significant shift in mobile internet usage. This new era of connectivity in the States began with the rollout by major carriers like WorldCom, Verizon, and AT&T in the early 2000s. While Japan had NTT Docomo pioneering 3G as early as 1998, the US caught up soon after, transforming the mobile landscape. However, despite the technological advancements, 3G was still in its nascent stages and wasn't as widely available, leading to data limitations for users. Providers often imposed data caps to manage the network load, a practice that influenced how people used their mobile devices. Users had to be mindful of their data consumption, as exceeding these limits could lead to additional charges or throttled speeds. Amidst this backdrop, the iPhone emerged not just as a new gadget but as a transformative device that showcased the potential of 3G connectivity. The iPhone's advanced capabilities, combined with its intuitive design, made the benefits of 3G speeds tangible to everyday users. Browsing the web, watching videos, and downloading content became markedly faster and smoother on the iPhone compared to older, keypad-based phones that were still struggling on slower networks. Dash. This strategic move by Kishin Aerospace to acquire an island was not solely focused on launching spacecraft but also aimed at deploying satellites specifically designed to enhance and expand 3G networks. By positioning these satellites in orbit, Kishin sought to provide a more comprehensive and far-reaching 3G coverage not just in densely populated urban areas, but also to remote regions where terrestrial cell towers were not feasible or economically viable. The concept behind deploying 3G network satellites is based on the idea of creating a cell tower in the sky. These satellites could relay 3G signals directly to mobile devices or to local ground stations, which then redistribute the signal to wider areas. This satellite-based approach could significantly reduce dead zones, improve network reliability during natural disasters or in rural areas, and complement existing terrestrial networks by offloading traffic during peak times, thus enhancing the overall user experience. Within just a few months of starting construction on Hakajojima, Kishin Aerospace had positioned itself to possibly begin launching these network-enhancing satellites. Given the company's streamlined planning and construction processes, the early launches would also focus on test satellites to fine-tune the technology and ensure compatibility with existing 3G infrastructure setting the stage for a broader rollout and potentially revolutionizing global 3G connectivity.
Qishin's ISP division, WorldCom, had already rolled out 3G networks by the year 2000, providing users with improved data speeds and connectivity over previous generations. This terrestrial-based 3G network, like others of its time, relied heavily on ground infrastructure cell towers strategically positioned to offer coverage to populated areas. While impressive, this approach had its limitations, particularly in terms of reach and consistency of service in remote or challenging terrains. The 3G network from Qishin Aerospace, however, represents a significant leap forward, distinct from WorldCom's earlier terrestrial endeavors. By utilizing satellites to distribute the 3G signal, Qishin Aerospace aimed to overcome the geographic and infrastructural constraints that bound traditional networks. This satellite-based system could provide consistent, widespread coverage that wasn't limited by the location of cell towers or the challenges of laying physical infrastructure over vast distances or through difficult terrains. From this strategic shift, Qishin is setting itself apart from traditional carriers in both Japan and the USA. Instead of focusing solely on terrestrial infrastructure for 3G connectivity, Qishin plans to develop a satellite network. By deploying satellites dedicated to 3G services, Qishin is pioneering a new frontier in telecommunications. Unlike typical carriers that rely on a dense array of cell towers, Qishin's satellite network would beam 3G signals directly from space, offering coverage that is not just nationwide but potentially global. While Hughes Network Systems pioneered satellite network services as early as 1996, their reach was not as expansive as what Qishin envisions. Moreover, Qishin strategically acquired Hughes Network Systems in 1997 for $7 billion, a move that positioned them advantageously within the satellite communications domain. This acquisition was not just a financial investment, it was a strategic integration that endowed Qishin with valuable industry experience and technological assets. By assimilating Hughes Network Systems, Qishin absorbed decades of satellite communication expertise and infrastructure. This has set a solid foundation for Qishin to innovate beyond Hughes's initial ventures. While Hughes laid the groundwork for satellite-based internet services, Qishin aims to expand this technology to create a more extensive, robust, and global network. Chapter 483, 2003 As 2003 dawned, the gaming community looked back on an eventful year. Among the standout titles of 2002, World of Warcraft by Qishin emerged as a monumental success, claiming the prestigious title of Game of the Year. This PC Mer page redefined the gaming landscape, captivating hundreds of thousands of players across different regions. Its popularity soared, particularly in Asia and the United States, where fans not only immersed themselves in its expansive world but also showed their dedication by purchasing WoW merchandise from Qishin stores. The acclaim for World of Warcraft was undeniable, setting it apart from the competition. However, 2002 was also a year marked by several other noteworthy releases. Killjoy 2, another installment in the popular series from Suzuki Entertainment, continued to build on its predecessor's legacy, delivering thrilling gameplay and a compelling narrative. The Happy series from Tora charmed players with its unique style and engaging puzzles, while the collaborative effort between Microsoft and Qishin on Beyond Good and Evil for the Xbox combined innovative storytelling with immersive gameplay, earning critical and commercial acclaim. These games, along with other memorable titles from major and independent studios, contributed to a vibrant year for the gaming industry. Each offered unique experiences, captivating players worldwide and leaving lasting impressions. As 2003 unfolded, the anticipation within the gaming community reached new heights, fueled by the announcements of upcoming games from major studios. Gamers were buzzing with excitement, eagerly awaiting the release of titles that promised to redefine their gaming experiences, especially following Qishin's tease of an upcoming entry in the famous GDA series. While specifics remained tightly under wraps, the mere mention of a new GDA game was enough to set forums and social media ablaze with speculation and excitement. Dash. Meanwhile, Qishin's R&D department was already laying the groundwork for 4G technology, even as 3G was still in its early stages and continuing to expand. The expansion of 3G, facilitated by Qishin's innovative partnership with Orbital Sciences Corporation, had seen the launch of a pioneering 3G satellite network in the USA at the end of December 2002. Despite this success, Qishin was determined to stay ahead of the curve by diving into the research and development of 4G technologies, ensuring they remained a step ahead in the telecommunications race. As Qishin's growth trajectory steepened, it became a powerhouse that demanded attention. With rapid expansion and diversification came heightened challenges. The company found itself increasingly under scrutiny, its remarkable rise had indeed put a metaphorical target on its back. 
Among the myriad challenges were legal disputes across various regions. Notably, governments in certain countries were clashing with Kishin over its GDA series and other mature-themed games. Accusations were flying that these games were impacting younger audiences adversely, leading to calls for bans or demands for compensation, especially since these games were initially released with age ratings deemed too lenient for their content. As Kishin announced the cessation of their 16-bit console production at the start of 2003, a wave of nostalgia swept through the gaming community. This decision marked the end of an era, Kishin had previously halted production of its beloved 8-bit console in 1999, and now, four years later, the 16-bit system was following suit. For many gamers who had grown up with these consoles, the news was bittersweet, signaling not just the end of a product line but the closing of a chapter in their personal gaming histories. This announcement spurred a rush among collectors and enthusiasts to purchase the last stocks of the 16-bit console from retail stores. Driven by a blend of nostalgia and speculation, they hoped to secure these pieces of gaming history, perhaps to relieve their childhood memories or as an investment to sell at a higher price in the future. Their speculation wasn't unfounded, in 2001, a Kishin 8-bit console had fetched $40,000 in the UAE. The value of a well-preserved, authentic Kishin 8-bit console had only appreciated since, becoming a coveted item among collectors, especially if they're gamers. This scramble to obtain the final units of the 16-bit console underscored the enduring legacy and affection that gamers held for Kishin's classic systems. While the company looked towards the future, pushing the boundaries of technology and gaming, the community clung to these tangible pieces of the past, reminders of simpler times and pixelated adventures that had captivated their younger selves. In a quiet move that spoke volumes, Kishin subtly released the source code for both their 8-bit and 16-bit systems on the internet. This strategic decision opened the floodgates for software enthusiasts and developers across the globe, providing them with the necessary tools to create emulators. This move to open source was a gift to the gaming community a way to preserve the legacy of Kishin's 8-bit and 16-bit eras. It allowed anyone with the interest and technical skill to develop emulators, ensuring that classic games could be enjoyed by future generations, free of charge. Shin's decision underscored a commitment not just to innovation and progress but to honoring and preserving the past. Meanwhile, another reason contributing to the halt in production of one of Kishin's popular consoles in 2003 was the intense competition in the console market. Over the years, rival companies had been fervently chasing advancements in graphics and performance, making the market incredibly dynamic and challenging. This relentless pursuit of technological improvement by competitors played a significant role in Kishin's decision to cease production of this particular console. Chapter 484, Kishin WII In January 2003, the video game industry was dominated by the relentless pursuit of higher resolutions and more powerful processors, the console market was evolving at a breakneck pace. Industry giants and newcomers alike were locked in an annual cycle of releases, each promising the next big leap in gaming technology. Established players like Suzuki and rising stars such as Microsoft's Xbox were at the forefront, pushing the boundaries of what was possible within the realms of 128-bit systems. Amidst this technological arms race, Kishin's KS2 stood tall, revered as the king of consoles by those who knew the ins and outs of the gaming world. Despite the flurry of new entries, the landscape remained largely unchanged. The latest consoles, while sleek and futuristic in design, did little to advance the core gaming experience beyond the established benchmarks set by giants like Kishin and Suzuki. The industry seemed stuck in a cycle of repetition, with companies wary of deviating from the successful formula, focusing instead on superficial improvements in graphics and performance. The gaming community began to notice this pattern, yearning for something genuinely innovative, something that would break the mold and redefine what a gaming console could be. Expectations were high but skepticism lingered as each new release seemed to echo its predecessors, each brand hesitant to step away from the shadows of the KS2's monumental success. Then, in an unexpected move that caught the entire market off guard, Kishin stepped into the spotlight with an announcement. They unveiled a new console, one that diverged sharply from the path trodden by its predecessors. This was not a console crafted solely for the hardcore gamer entrenched in complex controllers and high-definition battles. Instead, Kishin presented something revolutionary, a console that extended an invitation to a broader audience, reaching out to those previously untouched by the gaming world. The intrigue didn't stop at its broad appeal. The new console's controller was a standout feature, a novel design that promised fun and accessibility, breaking down the barriers of complicated button sequences and intimidating setups. It was crafted not just for hands accustomed to the grips of traditional gaming but for everyone. 
the games, too, deviated from the conventional path. They might not have boasted the cutting-edge graphics that were becoming industry standard, but they exuded charm and engagement, focusing on enjoyment and universal appeal rather than sheer visual prowess. This console was named the Kishin WII. Kishin had not just released a new product, they had sparked a new way of thinking about what gaming could be, inviting a wider audience to experience the joy and community of play. The Kishin WII shattered preconceived notions within the gaming community, both for established players and newcomers to the console market. Kishin, with its characteristic flair for innovation, once again showcased its ability to redefine the boundaries of gaming. This new console emphasized a pivotal message, gaming isn't solely about high-end graphics or cutting-edge performance concepts that seemed almost dogmatic among the major and emerging players in the industry. Through the teasers and trailers of the Kishin WII, a new definition of gaming emerged, one that championed fun and engagement over technical superiority. In one memorable teaser for the Kishin WII, this philosophy was brought to life vividly. The scene opened in a typical living room, bathed in the soft light of a lazy weekend afternoon. A diverse group of people, spanning different ages and backgrounds, gathered around the television. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation, but notably absent were the usual gaming paraphernalia there were no traditional controllers, no headsets, just the sleek, innovative WII controller in hand. The ad then cut to a close-up of a player's hands, gripping the WII controller with a mix of curiosity and excitement. The screen mirrored their movements, transforming a simple swing of the arm into a powerful tennis serve on the digital court. Laughter and cheers filled the room as players and onlookers alike became engrossed in this virtual match, ducking and weaving, serving and volleying. The trailer showcased the intuitive play style enabled by the WII controller players didn't just press buttons, they were actively moving, jumping, swinging, fully immersed in the action. The message was clear, this was more than a game, it was an experience, one that invited everyone to participate, regardless of gaming skill or experience. The closing shot of the ad featured the tagline, with Kishin WII, everyone plays. It was a powerful message, directly challenging the industry's prevailing norms. Kishin wasn't just offering a new way to game, they were extending an invitation to the world to redefine what it means to play, to engage, to connect. It was a testament to the philosophy that fun, above all, is the heart of gaming. Upon witnessing the unveiling of Kishin's new console, rival companies, which had long been trailing in the innovative giant's wake, found themselves facing a familiar predicament. They had become accustomed to following Kishin's lead, mirroring its strategies and innovations in an attempt to capture a share of the market Kishin so dominantly occupied. However, the introduction of the Kishin WII marked yet another turning point, presenting a fresh paradigm they were unprepared for. These companies, having focused on competing within established norms of graphics and performance, found themselves at a crossroads. The Kishin WII's emphasis on accessibility, enjoyment and physical engagement diverged sharply from the industry's prevailing trends. It wasn't just a new console, it was a new concept, redefining what video games could be and who they were for. This reliance on Kishin's innovation left competitors scrambling. They had been content to let Kishin dictate the direction of the gaming sector, comfortable in the role of fast followers rather than trailblazers. But with the WII's release, it became evident that merely copying Kishin's previous successes would no longer suffice. The industry had shifted. Gaming was no longer just about the hardcore gamers but had expanded to include families, casual players and those previously indifferent to video games. The realization dawned on these companies that to remain relevant, they could no longer rely solely on Kishin's vision. They needed to foster their own innovation, to think beyond traditional boundaries and conceive ideas that could captivate the ever-evolving gaming audience. Chapter 485, YT As the Kishin WII began to captivate gamers across the spectrum, particularly drawing in those who might not traditionally consider themselves gamers, Kishin made another significant announcement. In collaboration with its subsidiary, Google, Kishin unveiled a new website called YouTube. Envisioned as a platform for video sharing and a new realm for digital expression, YouTube was set to complement Kishin's expanding digital ecosystem. Initially, the website didn't capture the widespread attention Kishin had hoped for. In the vast sea of the Internet, YouTube struggled to distinguish itself and draw in significant user traffic. The concept of a video sharing platform was still novel, and many potential users were unsure of its utility or relevance to their lives. The tide began to shift when Shin, seen by everyone as Kishin's charismatic chairman and founder, decided to personally engage with the platform. Known globally as the king of video games, 
Suzuki's influence was undisputed. He uploaded a 360p video, a good resolution by the current standards, but it was the content of the video that made waves. In it, Shin spoke casually about gaming, sharing insights, personal anecdotes, and his vision for the future of the industry. The video was unscripted, genuine, and a stark departure from the polished corporate communications many had come to expect from figures of his stature. Shin's personal touch turned out to be the catalyst YouTube needed. The video quickly captured the attention of gamers and non-gamers alike, sparking curiosity and driving traffic to the website. News of Suzuki's unprecedented, candid discussion spread rapidly, attracting global media attention. Publications and broadcasters from around the world featured the video, highlighting the Kishin chairman's direct engagement with the gaming community and his innovative use of the new platform. Even with the unveiling of YouTube and the buzz generated by Shinro Suzuki's engaging video, the reality was that internet speeds hadn't caught up with the ambitions of video sharing on a large scale. Uploading videos or streaming them on YouTube was still a challenge, buffering and slow load times were common frustrations among early users. Recognizing this bottleneck, Kishin, alongside its subsidiary Worldcom, dedicated itself to spearheading the advancement of global internet standards. Aware that the potential of platforms like YouTube was directly tied to the accessibility and speed of online connectivity, Kishin committed substantial resources to research and development in the telecommunications sector. Worldcom, under the guidance of Kishin, embarked on a mission to enhance infrastructure, laying down more extensive fiber-optic networks and investing in technologies that could improve data transmission rates. This effort extended beyond mere infrastructure upgrades. Kishin and Worldcom worked closely with regulators, other tech companies, and international organizations to establish new standards for internet speed and reliability. They championed the adoption of protocols that were more efficient and introduced innovations in data compression and transmission, ensuring that the improvements were not just technical but also accessible and applicable globally. Dash. As the school bell rang, signaling the end of another day, Shinichi and his friends gathered, a familiar routine that had woven them tightly together over the months. Ryo, ever the contemplative one couldn't help but voice the looming uncertainty of their academic futures. We'll move up to the next grade in April, and I don't know if we'll be in the same class again. The thought hung heavily in the air. It will be pretty sad if we're not from the same class next grade, Satoshi added, his tone heavy with resignation. Shinichi, broke into a light-hearted chuckle, cutting through the gloom that had started to settle over his friends. Why are you guys so downcast? We can still meet up after class ends, right? His words, simple yet sincere, offered a sliver of consolation. Arnold, picking up on Shinichi's upbeat energy, nodded in agreement. Shinichi's right. He seized the moment to steer the conversation towards a more uplifting topic. Anyway, guys, did you see that video on YouTube? The mention of YouTube immediately sparked interest. Oh, the one about video game discussions by the founder of Kishin. Takeshi asked, his spirits visibly brightened by the shift in topic. The mood among the friends lightened considerably as they delved into the trending topics of January 2003. They eagerly discussed the newly announced Kishin console, the WII, marveling at its innovative design and the promise of bringing gaming to a broader audience. Then the conversation turned to YouTube, the new platform that was beginning to stir curiosity far and wide. Arnold, trying to lighten the mood further, shared his own experience with the burgeoning platform. I've uploaded a video on YouTube, recorded from my iPhone and guess what? It got three views. Only three views. Satoshi echoed, a hint of surprise in his voice. Ryo, chimed in with a grin. Arnold's lucky to have three views, I couldn't even get two. The only view was from me checking the video myself. A moment of silence hung as they processed the humor in their unpopular videos. Then Arnold, with a sheepish grin, admitted, guys, those three views were all from me too. The group burst into laughter the shared experience of their online endeavors serving as a small bond. But then Shinichi, with a more contemplative tone, added, that site is dead. Besides the first video, which was by my dad and gained thousands of views, other videos barely scratched the surface in terms of viewership. Shinichi's words hadn't immediately registered with his friends, but when they finally did, a moment of stunned silence followed. They turned to look at Shinichi with wide eyes and open mouths, a mix of surprise and disbelief written all over their faces. The realization hit them all at once, leaving them dumbfounded. Wait, his dad. They thought in unison. Chapter 486, WII 
On January 20, 2003, Kishin launched the Kishin WII, introducing it to an eager market. Despite its graphical capabilities and gameplay immersion not quite matching up to Kishin's previous console, the KS2, consumers were ready and waiting, their enthusiasm undiminished. The concept of a more interactive, inclusive gaming experience was enough to draw crowds to stores and malls, each person excited to bring home this new innovation. Among the excited customers was a casual foreign gamer who had been eagerly anticipating the release. After purchasing the Kishin WII from a bustling Kishin store in Tokyo, he couldn't wait to share the experience with his friends back at their shared apartment. The group gathered around the television in the living room, the console's unique controllers in hand, ready to dive into a game of virtual tennis. As they started playing, laughter and cheers filled the room. The game was simple to pick up but challenging to master, leading to a series of humorous missteps and fiercely competitive rallies. The WII's motion controls required them to physically swing their arms, mimicking the actions of a tennis player, which added an element of physical activity that was both exhausting and exhilarating. Watch this serve! One friend exclaimed, swinging too early and completely missing the virtual ball. The room erupted in laughter as his character on the screen mimicked the failed attempt, swinging at thin air. Another friend, determined to outdo the previous attempt, focused intently before swinging her arm with all her might, sending the virtual ball flying at an impressive speed across the court. Cheers followed as the ball was expertly returned, the rally continuing back and forth, each player fully immersed in the game. Dash. The Kishin WII tennis game quickly emerged as one of the standout titles in the console's early lineup, largely due to its prominent feature in the Kishin WII trailers, teasers, and advertisements. Its simplicity, coupled with the innovative use of motion controls, made it an instant favorite among casual gamers and seasoned players alike, captivating a broad audience with its accessible and engaging gameplay. Beyond tennis, there were other notable WII games that caught the attention of casual gamers. Bowling, another game that utilized the WII's motion-sensitive controllers, allowed players to mimic the action of rolling a bowling ball down an alley, turning living rooms into virtual bowling lanes. This game, much like tennis, proved to be a hit for its fun, social gameplay that could easily involve multiple players. Golf was another game that leveraged the WII's unique controls, offering players the chance to swing their controllers like a golf club. The precision and technique required for virtual golf provided a slightly more relaxed but equally entertaining experience, appealing to those who enjoyed a strategic challenge. Boxing added a more intense, physically demanding option to the WII's repertoire. Players could throw punches in the air, duck, and weave, getting a workout as they battled it out in the virtual ring. This game exemplified the WII's ability to offer a diverse range of experiences, catering to different tastes and activity levels. These games, alongside the flagship tennis, formed the core of the Kishin WII's appeal at launch. They showcased the console's innovative approach to gaming, where physical movement and social interaction were as integral to the experience as the on-screen action. Within just a few days of its release, the Kishin WII had managed to redefine what it meant to be a gamer. People who had previously shown little interest in video games suddenly found themselves engrossed in WII sports and adventures, proudly adopting the gamer label. The console's unique appeal lay in its ability to make gaming accessible and enjoyable for everyone, regardless of their experience or skill level. The Kishin WII's impact extended beyond just the players, it served as a wake-up call to other major players in the video game industry. The inclusion of physical movement as a core element of gameplay was a revelation. It blurred the lines between gaming and exercising, introducing a health-conscious aspect to the activity that had never been seen before on such a scale. This innovative approach prompted a re-evaluation of what video games could offer, pushing the industry toward more active and engaging experiences. Recognizing the potential of this new gaming paradigm, video game studios quickly began collaborating with Kishin to develop titles specifically for the WII console. These partnerships resulted in a diverse library of games that took full advantage of the console's motion controls, offering players an array of experiences from sports simulations to dance challenges, and even adventure games requiring physical gestures to navigate and interact with the game world. The video game studios quickly recognized the burgeoning market potential within the Kishin WII console. Although the WII might not have matched the Kishin KS2 in terms of raw graphical power or traditional gaming metrics, it carved out its own significant niche. The WII's unique appeal to casual and non-gamers a demographic traditionally overlooked by the industry revealed an expansive and untapped market. Studios saw the opportunity to reach a broader audience, one that valued fun, 
accessible gameplay over high-end specs or complex narratives. This realization spurred a wave of creativity among developers, who began to design games that leveraged the WII's motion controls to create immersive, intuitive experiences. From sports and fitness titles to party games and simplified adventure games, the content being developed was as varied as the new audience the console attracted. Chapter 487, Benefits of WII Gaming the release of the Kishin WII in Japan had quickly garnered attention, not just from eager gamers and industry insiders but from the media as well. Within a week, the narrative surrounding video games, traditionally skewed towards skepticism and concern over their impact on youth, began to face scrutiny. Media outlets, both in Japan and internationally, had long criticized video games, painting them as detrimental to young people's mental health. Such narratives even went as far as suggesting that excessive gaming should be considered a concern by mental health professionals. Kishin, as a pioneering and dominant force in the video game industry, found itself at the center of this controversy. The company's name had become synonymous with video gaming itself, credited with catapulting the industry into mainstream culture through iconic titles like Super Mario and a slew of other beloved 8-bit games. With its leading role in console manufacturing, game development, and distribution, Kishin represented the video game industry to the public and, by extension, bore the brunt of the media's defamation. The equation of Kishin with video games and by extension, the idea that video games led to negative behaviors among the youth had become a prevalent narrative. However, the introduction of the Kishin WII started to challenge these long-held beliefs. The console's innovative approach, requiring players to physically move as part of the gaming experience, introduced a new perspective on what video gaming could entail. Within just a week of the Kishin WII's market presence, a shift in public opinion began to emerge, albeit among a minority of the population in Japan. Those who had the opportunity to play the Kishin WII experienced firsthand the potential for video games to incorporate physical activity into play. This realization sparked discussions and reconsiderations about the nature of video gaming. No longer were games seen merely as sedentary activities, with the Kishin WII, gaming could also mean engaging in exercise blending entertainment with health benefits. This nuanced understanding began to counteract the negative stereotypes perpetuated by the media. While it was a gradual change, confined to a segment of the population, it represented a significant step towards redefining video games in the public consciousness. Shinstream, Kishin's pioneering social media website, launched officially in 1996, had seen its popularity surge over the years. By mid-2002, it had even started to outpace Yahoo in terms of traffic, a testament to its growing influence and user base. The platform's success could be attributed to its liberal content policies, allowing users to share a wide array of posts, from the mundane to the mildly controversial, provided overly sensitive content was avoided and adult material was appropriately labeled for viewers 18 and older. This open environment fostered a vibrant and diverse online community. As of January 2003, one topic dominated the Japan server of Shinstream number Kishin WII. Despite the general hesitance among Japanese people towards heavy social media use, Shinstream had attracted hundreds of thousands of users, making it a bustling hub for discussions and opinions. The feedback on the Kishin WII was overwhelmingly positive, sparking lively discussions and personal anecdotes among the platform's diverse user base. Among the numerous posts, one particularly heartwarming story stood out, shared by a user who identified himself as a father. He shared his initial skepticism towards video games, attributing them to his child's sedentary lifestyle. However, his perspective shifted dramatically after purchasing the Kishin WII. He detailed how his previously inactive and overweight child began engaging in physical activity through the console's interactive games, essentially exercising without even realizing it. The father expressed his astonishment and gratitude towards the Kishin WII confessing that what he once viewed as a harmful distraction had become a catalyst for positive change in his child's health and well-being. I've never been a fan of video games, always thought they were a waste of time. But after seeing my son, who's not exactly the most active kid, get up and move with the Kishin WII, I'm sold. This isn't just gaming, it's a fun way to get him moving. He's been playing tennis on it every day after school, and I swear he's getting more exercise now than he ever did. Never thought I'd say this but I'm now a video game supporter well, at least when it comes to the WII. Number Kishin WII The post quickly garnered likes, shares, and a slew of supportive comments, sparking a broader conversation about the unexpected benefits of the Kishin WII. Other users chimed in with their stories. 
Another user, sharing her own family's transformation, commented, couldn't agree more. The whole family's been having WII nights, and it's the most active we've been together in ages. It's wonderful. Echoing the sentiment, another user added, I was skeptical about the WII at first, but watching my kids leap off the couch to play bowling and genuinely working up a sweat has completely changed my mind. I'm genuinely impressed. Number Kishin WII for the win. These positive changes marked a significant shift in the gaming landscape, particularly for console gaming. While the concept of physical movement in gaming wasn't entirely new arcade games like dance machines had been engaging players in physical activity for years these were mostly isolated experiences, confined to the arcade environment and not widely adopted for home use. The Kishin WII, however, brought this interactive, movement-based gaming into the living room, making it accessible and appealing for commercial, everyday use. It introduced many people to a new way of gaming, one that combined entertainment with physical activity in a way that hadn't been seen before in the mainstream console market. Despite the burgeoning popularity of this healthier, more active form of gaming, its positive impacts were largely underreported by mainstream TV media. Many outlets, steadfast in their critical stance on video games, hesitated to acknowledge the WII's beneficial effects, fearing it might counteract their long held narrative that video games were detrimental to physical and mental health. This reluctance to report on the WII's success in promoting physical activity through gaming meant that the console's potential to reshape perceptions about video games was not fully recognized in all circles. However, a few forward-thinking media outlets did begin to cover the positive aspects of the Kishin WII, highlighting stories of families coming together, individuals finding joy in exercise, and even stories of improved physical well-being as a result of engaging with the console. These reports, though few and far between, offered a glimpse into the potential for video games to contribute positively to society, challenging the dominant discourse and paving the way for a broader acceptance of video games as a beneficial part of modern life. Chapter 488, Theories Again, while the Kishin WII sales in the first two weeks post-launch might not have rivaled the explosive early sales figures of its predecessor, the KS2, it still marked a commendable success. The WII carved out its own niche, garnering positive impressions across Japan and beginning to gain traction internationally. Its unique approach to gaming, emphasizing physical activity and family-friendly entertainment, offered a fresh perspective that resonated with many. As 2003 ushered in February, the world faced a burgeoning health crisis. The World Health Organization issued a global warning about the severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, sparking concern across nations and putting the global community on high alert. In the midst of this escalating health emergency, Kishin Pharmaceutical emerged as a surprising ally to the WHO and other health institutions battling SARS. Founded humbly in 1997 as an extension of Kishin's broadening ventures, Kishin Pharmaceutical had matured significantly over the years. This growth was bolstered by strategic support from Kishin's diverse business units, including advancements in technology and logistics that were readily applied to pharmaceutical distribution and research. Under the direction led by Shin, who brought knowledge from a future, Kishin Pharmaceutical had directed its R&D efforts towards the study of viruses, including those similar to SARS. This foresight positioned the company at the forefront of the fight against the outbreak. By employing experts and professionals from various fields, Kishin had assembled a formidable team dedicated to finding solutions to some of the most pressing health challenges. Kishin Pharmaceutical's assistance to the WHO and other health organizations in combating SARS was multifaceted. Leveraging Kishin's technological prowess, the pharmaceutical division provided critical data analysis tools for tracking the virus's spread and predicting hotspots. Furthermore, Kishin's logistics networks facilitated the swift distribution of medical supplies and personal protective equipment, PP, to areas in dire need. Perhaps most crucially, Kishin Pharmaceuticals' research into antiviral compounds showed promising early results, offering hope for effective treatments. Through collaboration with global health bodies, Kishin shared its findings, contributing to the collective pool of knowledge and accelerating the international response effort. The company's commitment extended beyond mere research and supply chain logistics, Kishin Pharmaceutical also engaged in public education campaigns. Utilizing Kishin's entertainment and media platforms, they disseminated vital information on prevention measures, helping to curb the spread of misinformation and calm public fears. As SARS concerns proliferated across platforms like Shinstream, the imaginative world of Resident Evil, with its eerie parallels to real-world fears, found a resurgence in public discourse. The release of Resident Evil 4, still fresh in the minds of gamers, 
provided ample fuel for speculative theories, particularly in the U.S., where the franchise had a fervent following. Shinstream's U.S. server became a hotbed for discussions weaving together fiction and reality, reigniting old fears and fantasies about bioengineering disasters akin to those depicted in the game. User Dark Theory Gamer posted, Doesn't anyone else see the similarities? Resident Evil warned us about corporations like Umbrella, playing God with viruses. Now we've got SARS spreading, and I can't help but wonder, is life imitating art? Another user, Biohazard Believer, chimed in, exactly my thought. RE4 just came out a few months ago, and boom, SARS is on the rise. Coincidence? I think not. It's like Kishin is hinting at something bigger, something darker, behind the scenes. The discussion spiraled, with some users even pointing fingers at Kishin itself. Truthseeker99 wrote, What if Kishin is the real-life umbrella? They've got their hands in everything, tech, pharmaceuticals, you name it. Maybe Resident Evil is more documentary than fiction. Maybe they're revealing the truth under the guise of entertainment. Another user, Pharma Watcher, pointed to historical precedents, it's naive to think there aren't bad players in the pharma world. The history's there, with scandals and unethical experiments. While Kishin's efforts against SARS are commendable, it doesn't erase the fact that there could be others out there, operating in the shadows, experimenting with things they shouldn't. User BioThriller fan commented, Let's not forget, the theory of an umbrella-like pharma company messing with dangerous viruses isn't new. This chatter started back when the first Resident Evil game hit the shelves. SARS hitting the news just blew the dust off these old theories. In a more measured response, Ethical Gamer wrote, Reviving these theories now, with SARS making headlines, makes sense. Fear makes people look for patterns, even where there might be none. But let's not lump Kishin with the real culprits. History shows us that there are indeed evil pharma companies, but broad accusations without proof only spread more fear. The dialogue on Shinstream reflected a deep-seated mistrust of the pharmaceutical industry, fueled by past controversies and amplified by the timing of the SARS outbreak coinciding with the release of Resident Evil 4. This confluence of events breathed new life into decades-old theories about secret virus research and the potential for a zombie apocalypse, theories that found a fertile ground among gamers and conspiracy theorists alike. Despite the diverging opinions, what emerged was a collective call for vigilance. Users advocated for transparency, ethical research practices, and accountability within the pharmaceutical industry to prevent the dystopian future depicted in video games from becoming a reality. While the discussions often veered into the realm of speculation, they also underscored a broader concern about the power wielded by corporations in shaping the future of human health and safety. Chapter 489, RTS Mod Completion In Shin's office, a space that might seem to outsiders like a sanctuary of leisure amidst the bustling corporate world of Kishin, the reality was markedly different. While his son, Shinichi, might occasionally witness moments that appeared carefree a father seemingly lost in the world of video games. Yet, this image was a facade, a mere sliver of time carved out from the relentless pace of leadership that defined his days. His empire, Kishin, demanded relentless vigilance and strategic foresight, especially in sectors as critical as pharmaceuticals. Behind the scenes, Shin was the architect of an empire that spanned from technology to pharmaceuticals, each division a cog in the vast machinery of Kishin. Of these, Kishin Pharmaceutical held a special place in Shin's strategic vision. Aware of the shadows cast by future pandemics, Shin had directed this arm of his empire towards becoming a bulwark against viral threats. SARS was just the beginning, a harbinger of the challenges that lay ahead. With the knowledge of the future, Shin was acutely conscious of the viral storms on the horizon H1N1, Ebola, Zika, and the cataclysmic COVID-19. Each name was etched in his mind, a list of battles yet to be fought. His mission was clear, to ensure that Kishin Pharmaceutical would stand ready at the vanguard of these fights, armed with research, vaccines, and treatments forged in the fires of innovation. Investments flowed into research and development, turning Kishin Pharmaceutical into a fortress of science ready to confront the unseen enemies of tomorrow. Collaborations with global health bodies were fostered, bringing together the brightest minds in a shared quest to shield humanity from the ravages of disease. This was Shin's war, fought not with swords or guns, but with intellect, science, and unwavering resolve. The moments Shinichi witnessed, those brief interludes of gaming, were Shin's way of momentarily stepping back from the weight of his empire. They were his method of staying connected to Kishin's cultural impact while allowing himself a breath in the relentless pace of his duties. But these moments were fleeting, 
for the challenges of leading Qishin demanded a return to the strategic battlefield. As Shin navigated the vast responsibilities of leading Qishin's myriad adventures, a parallel project close to his heart was coming to fruition the modding of the Warcraft series into what would soon be known as Dota. This endeavor wasn't just a testament to Shin's love for gaming but also to his belief in the creativity and potential of the modding community. After months of collaborative work with some of the most talented modders he had discovered online, their project was nearing completion. Shin had taken on the role of project leader, channeling his unique insights and future knowledge into guiding the development of this mod. Under his online alias Invoker69, he was poised to release Dota on Kishin's video game modding sector, a platform that celebrated the creativity and innovation within the gaming community. Kishin's website for established video game mods was a hub where creators could share their work, but it offered more than just a repository. These mods could be integrated with Kishin Plays, the company's proprietary software, enabling online multiplayer functionality. This feature was pivotal, transforming single-player experiences or land-based games into global online phenomena. Already, some mods hosted on Kishin's platform had gained significant popularity in the online multiplayer arena. Yet, Shin believed that Dota had the potential to eclipse them all, even StarCraft, Kishin's own RTS game that had dominated online gaming communities. Dota's unique blend of strategy, teamwork, and hero-based gameplay offered something new and exciting, a fresh take on the RTS genre that could captivate players around the world. He envisioned Dota becoming a cornerstone of online multiplayer gaming a title that would not only draw players in droves but also set new standards for what modded games could achieve. As Invoker 69, Shin was ready to unveil Dota to the world, confident in its potential to reshape the landscape of online gaming. As the Dota project neared completion, the group of modders who had worked with Invoker 69 decided to adopt usernames inspired by the game's heroes. This simple act was a nod to their contributions and a way to remain connected to the project they had poured so much effort into. Among them were usernames like Rogue Knight 33, Crystal Maiden Ice, and Storm Spirit Zap, each picking a moniker that resonated with their personal experience or favorite character within the game. Meanwhile, scattered across various corners of the globe, the talented modders who had collaborated with Invoker 69 on the Dota project awaited its release with bated breath. These individuals, brought together by a shared passion for gaming and a desire to push its boundaries, had already experienced firsthand the thrill of playing Dota during its development phase. Their excitement was not just about seeing their work come to fruition, it was also about witnessing the reaction of the broader gaming community to something they had helped create. The modders held Invoker 69 in high regard, not only for his leadership throughout the project but also for his innovative approach to game design. They had seen how his insights and suggestions had transformed their initial ideas into a game that was both challenging and immensely enjoyable. As Dota made its debut on Kishin's video game mods section, the modders were among the first to spread the word within their own networks. They shared their experiences of working on the project, highlighting Invoker 69's contributions without fully knowing the extent of his real-world influence as the head of Kishin. Their discussions on forums, social media, and within gaming communities were not just expressions of pride in their collective achievement, they were also invitations to gamers everywhere to dive into the world they had created. They talked about the game's strategic depth, the diverse roster of heroes, and the unique gameplay mechanics that set Dota apart from anything else available. The modders knew that Dota's success hinged on the community's reception, but they felt a quiet confidence. They had poured countless hours into its development, guided by Invoker 69's vision, and now, as the game went live, they watched with anticipation, ready to see how their creation would reshape the landscape of online gaming. Chapter 490, Dota In a cozy room filled with the ambient hum of a high-performance PC, Webster, an avid PC gamer from the USA, found himself scrolling through the Kishin website, searching for something new to capture his interest. His friends on Kishin Play had been buzzing about a game mod called Dota, piquing his curiosity enough to give it a download and see what the fuss was about. With no particular expectations, Webster booted up Dota, choosing to play against computer-controlled opponents for his first foray into this unknown territory. The game's interface and mechanics were unfamiliar presenting a challenge that reminded him of his days mastering StarCraft. Yet, as the minutes turned into hour, Webster found himself increasingly engrossed. Dota was hard, no doubt about it. The strategy required to effectively control a single hero in the midst of chaotic battles demanded a level of focus and quick thinking that Webster hadn't anticipated. Each failed attempt to secure victory only spurred him on, determined to figure out the winning strategies. But it wasn't just the challenge that kept him hooked, it was the fun that came with it. 
Webster, after getting a feel for Dota by playing against the computer, decided it was time to elevate his experience by diving into the multiplayer online. He launched the Kishin Play software, eagerly anticipating his first foray into playing Dota with real opponents. As he selected the multiplayer option and matchmaking began, Webster noticed that the process was somewhat slow. It took a while before a match was finally found, a minor inconvenience, but one he was willing to overlook for the sake of experiencing Dota in a more dynamic setting. Once connected, he found the gameplay to be slightly laggy. Webster wasn't particularly surprised, he understood that the servers for game mods, especially those enabling multiplayer online play, often lacked the robustness of those directly supported by major video game studios or Kishin itself. Webster was aware that certain game mods enjoyed smoother server experiences, often due to increased support from Kishin or the major studios that originally developed the games. This support usually came as a response to the mod's popularity, which, in turn, could enhance the visibility and appeal of the studio's original titles. Some mods even garnered enough attention to be officially acquired by these larger entities, a testament to their impact within the gaming community. Despite the lag, Webster's first foray into playing Dota with real opponents was a genuinely enjoyable experience. The unpredictable nature of human opponents added a layer of excitement and complexity that computer-controlled opponents couldn't replicate. Even through the occasional stutter in gameplay, he found himself fully engaged, strategizing in real time and adapting to the flow of the match. This initial multiplayer session marked the beginning of Webster's deeper engagement with Dota. The lag was a small price to pay for the richness of playing against others, each match a learning opportunity and a chance to improve. Dash. Currently, the Kishin Play, KP, user base actively playing Dota online numbers in the thousands a modest figure that contributes to longer matchmaking times but also signals a growing interest in this new mod. This budding popularity, while promising, still falls short of reaching the heights achieved by mods based on Doom, a classic Kishin game from the 1990s that has long held the title of the modding community's favorite canvas. The pioneering spirit of Doom modders set a high bar, showcasing the game's versatility and the creativity of its fan base. Mods for other Kishin titles like Warcraft and Starcraft exist, yet none have captivated the modding community's imagination quite like Doom has however, Dota, emerging from the Warcraft series, introduces a compelling new frontier that might, in time, rival or even surpass Doom's storied legacy in the hearts of modders. The potential for Dota to redefine modders' preferences stems from its innovative gameplay mechanics and the novel concept of focusing on hero-driven combat within the RTS framework of Warcraft. As the days unfolded, the mod Dota, released under the moniker Invoker 69, witnessed a steady uptick in downloads. A fascinating pattern began to emerge, pinpointing Asia as the epicenter of this burgeoning interest. Among the countries riding the wave of Dota's ascent, South Korea stood out, its gamers flocking to the mod in droves. South Korea, with its rapidly developing technology landscape and a burgeoning PC gaming culture, proved to be fertile ground for Dota's growth. The country's well-established love for the RTS genre, epitomized by the national obsession with StarCraft, laid the foundation for Dota's reception. The game's strategic depth, requiring quick thinking and faster reflexes, resonated well with South Korean gamers who were already accustomed to the high-octane, competitive gameplay of RTS titles. Dota, being a mod of the Warcraft series, naturally piqued the interest of a gaming community that revered strategy games. However, it was Dota's unique blend of RTS elements with hero-driven mechanics that captivated the South Korean gamers. The game offered something both familiar and novel, a combination that proved irresistible to those seeking the next big challenge in the realm of competitive gaming. As word of mouth spread and more gamers experienced the strategic complexity and competitive allure of Dota, the mod's popularity in South Korea surged. Thanks for listening.